வணக்கம் ப்ரூஸ்
good morning class and the good morning bruce uh, bruce can you hear me yes i can hear you good morning yes uh so thank you for coming on time and uh, I, I know it is not easy to make it on sunday and as is from monday to uh, friday uh, many people are busy working and doing different things so such that in the weekends uh, they are quite tired so it's not easy to join weekend classes but you know when you have passion for something or when you have uh, some of the, the uh, some targeted objective so nothing can just make you fail to do that expect despite all those uh, surrounding challenges so you need to overcome all these challenges so thank you for those who managed to join today's session and the you are hearing Felicia Vajaneza from ECPA, uh, based in the education department. So for us in ECPA, we organized this session to help you get more understanding and the, uh, more refresher. It is just a refresher session as you've been attending different uh, classes at your tuition providers. So for us, we organized it in such a way that we bring different uh, students. You know, we have many tuition providers. So for us, we want to make a revision uh, or summary of what is important to be covered as far as this November 2022 examination is concerned. And the, of course, in doing so, we want to increase your capacity and your confidence in the exam such that you is or as we as a as the institute we get uh more passes than we used to have so we want all of you if possible to pass this paper advanced financial reporting so in this paper this paper will be moderated by bruce and uh, of course i'll give him a time for to, to present himself and the, it, will, it will take uh, two, twice, just today. One session is today, and the, another session is scheduled uh, next week as part of the table. Yes, the, the second session we 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 take press uh not no, no, not weekend it is on monday 21st november it is on monday so for questions suggestions clarifications you can use q and a box or you can use chat box i i think it is not the first time that they are going to attend classes using this um using this zoom uh you've been as you are in advanced i think you have attended many sessions so same practice need to be applied here and of course rules and rules and regulation apply in class uh so let me call upon and they will come mr bruce uh to go ahead and give us what he has prepared for us Bruce, you are most welcome, and the front is yours. Thank you very much, Felician. And uh, just to say again, good morning to all of you that have been able to brave the early morning and uh, spare time to come and join uh, this session. So like you've heard from Felician, this is uh, purely a compliment to what you're already getting from your uh, tuition providers. But it's a compliment that we think should add value and quality. And uh, yes, the expectation is that by the time you're in the exam, or by the time you actually go to the examination room, you should be a more confident student with uh, the, uh, the extra additional support that we're actually giving through uh, these sessions. Please uh, take these sessions as uh, very, very important because uh, 
you basically are getting the tips that help you to complement the tips that you're getting from the different tuition providers that you have to attend to. Like you've heard from uh, Felician, my name is Bruce Intege. I am a CPA and uh, I basically have had a, a quite a number of experience in handling uh, a paper like this for years and years and years. It's actually coming to so many years, more than 15 years handling uh, paper uh, of this nature. So uh, like again, you've heard from Fe Felician, you certainly have a few weeks to a few days to exams. Please, it's very important that between now and your exam date, do not only recite or do not only kind of listen to what your tuition provider is telling you or what I'm actually telling you, but get practical. This is a paper that actually demands for practice before your exam date. So, and I'm talking from experience, experience in terms of the fact that I've been a student before, years back, but also experience from the fact that I've handled students and I know how to be able to assess uh, performance based on the student's practicability. So practice is, possible, uh, is your route, your very first route to passing this exam. So again, I'll continue to echo that fine as much as you're going to sit in there and listen, but uh, we need to work together practically. And uh, I'll ensure that my presentation to you is actually going to be practical as well. So if it were possible, I would kindly request even while I can't see you, while you're actually attending or listening in there, it's, it would be important that you are practical, that whatever information or tip I give you, put it somewhere on a piece of paper or in a book. Because it's actually going to be a reminder along the way, over the days up to the exam date, to keep looking at that and ensuring that, yes, you have the right tactic and the right preparation for this particular exam. But beyond that, even the questions that I may not have looked at or the questions that you have access to beyond what we've actually seen today, please spot them out and actually practice them, practice them, and practice them. At the end of the day, practice, practice, practice will be equivalent to confident passing, but not only confident passing, quality, because that's what Iqbal wants. Quality as an accountant out there who has actually qualified as an Iqbal member and actually out there to actually do the best and to ensure that you actually uh, deliver to the expectations. So uh, I'll be taking you through my presentation today in two forms. One is that I'll actually be using slides which I'll actually, which will actually give us the first uh, kind of like a introduction or background of what we are, what we're actually doing and what we're actually prepared for in today's session and in the next session that we shall actually be following on after today's session. But secondly, I'll also be going through questions or exam past paper questions. And those are coming from those very important key topics that are very, very pivotal in this paper, but also pivotal in the sense that out there practically, while you're actually practicing as an accountant or as an auditor, these are basically what you are likely going to be interfacing with. So this is a paper that is so practical that you don't even just deliver it in terms of theory. So you need to actually translate that into real, real questions and how you are able to apply that into a question approach. So I'll actually be dealing with those questions, but what will keep guiding me to those questions will actually be summaries that are summarizing each key topic in the paper, each key topic the, that is derived or picked from your syllabus, and each key topic I believe your tutor is actually giving a lot of emphasis on. So for me, my, uh, my responsibility today will be to kind of wrap it up or summarize it up or actually pick out the key important issues or features of that topic for exam purposes. In other words, to focus you in the exam mindset, and then we actually get into a question from a past paper exam from that key topic. Please remember that even while I look at the past paper questions, please your examiner for this particular paper will always ensure that the question is original original in the sense that it's not a, a duplicate of what has been examined in the past, but uh, original in the sense that it, uh, it's actually bringing out the key messages and key very important areas in a particular topic. All that you need to do is to actually remember and recite and be very well equipped with the principles 
in that topic, such that whatever original question an examiner brings in front of you, you are ready to apply the principles into that question. That is the key, not only to this paper, but the key throughout the ICPAL course or CPA course, which is very important. So at this point, of course, like uh, you've heard from uh, Felician, uh, you'll actually be raising questions or comments or concerns through the chat room, and I'll keep interfacing while I'm making my presentation. I'll keep checking what's in the chat room and addressing those questions uh, for me to ensure that I've left no one behind and we've all moved together. So I'm going to share my screen at this point, and then uh, we move on to uh, our uh, areas of our concern today. So I'm hoping we're all able to see the screen in there. And uh, uh, of course, I, I, I just to again to reintroduce myself, I also tutor. First of all, I'm a certified trainer uh, with uh, ICPAL, but I also tutor with an, uh, an institute that has the accreditation uh, to provide classes. In, uh, initially, we are only providing online classes, but we've already completed almost the process of uh, our own uh, premises within uh, Chigali City, where uh, at the start of next year, we are actually going to be delivering face-to-face -face classes as well. So blending the online with the face-to-face -face classes. So we're called Inest Academy Limited. And uh, like I've said, we've actually been online only, but we are now translating that into uh, a face-to-face -face class. Uh, we are not only in Chigali or Rwanda, we are actually uh, working within the East African countries, uh, the other East African countries as well. So our paper, A13, uh, or Adverse Financial Reporting, basically has two sections. So your exam will have two sections, section A and section B. Now section A will have one question which is compulsory, and that question basically uh, takes 50 marks. Your pass mark is 50, and this question is also 50 marks. Now, this question will usually have, or will always have, uh, will always cover the group accounts uh, topic or the consolidation topics. There are quite enough or a number of uh, consolidation topics within that big area. So 50 marks are in there, but in addition, there'll be also other key areas, part of the accounting or financial statements that will actually be within that group accounting context, including the possibility that uh, there can be a part B or part C, which is not pure on consolidation, but it's actually looking at other accounting issues, which are very key. So in total, there are 50 marks on that question and the question is compulsory. Now, section B has three questions. Two of those questions is what you attempt. And uh, usually that's a little bit tricky uh, if you have to drop one question. So there could be usually situations where you think of which question to actually drop. And that's why this paper will usually give you those extra minutes to actually go through the entire paper, read through the questions, especially section B questions, and check which question you think you can actually drop and which two questions you're actually taking on. Now, other is each of the three questions in section B is 25 marks. So remember, you're picking two out of the three to give the other total of the 50 marks if each question is actually 25 marks. Now this section B covers all the other or the remaining areas of your uh, your, your your syllabus, uh, which especially those that are not covered or will not have been covered in section A in that particular setting. So recall that in section A, yes, whereas we have the group accounts, there are those other key areas, but if those key areas have not covered others, then those other areas will be covered in section B questions. But you still can have a question in section B uh, that refers or relates to consolidation or group accounting related issues. But this will be on now issue by issue, as opposed to preparing consolidated financial statements as well, or uh, again. Please, I want to emphasize that this is not a paper where you support to say, let me only reduce or restrict my reading to only these five topics or to this number of topics, and let me drop the other topic. Please, this is a paper where the examiner will examine any area of the syllabus 
And by the time you are sitting this paper, you realize that it covers almost the entire syllabus, at least 90% of the syllabus. So don't take that weakness, which I know usually students have, to spot examiners and therefore to limit your reading to only particular topics if you want to be confident in this particular exam. So in other words, there's a reason why ICPAL has a total uh, a totality of a syllabus requiring you as a student to actually read that entire syllabus. So you have these few days or weeks to go to ensure that you are smart on each topic or each area of the syllabus. Now, as part of the tip in the exam or as part of your uh, requirement as a student, you need to, and to be able to be confident to sit and write this paper comfortably, you need to have that ability as a student to evaluate or to appraise or to even critically assess or discuss and apply the accounting principles that you've picked from the different accounting standards. Remember that in this paper, you are majorly covering IFRSs and IASs. So you need to actually be able to equip yourself with those principles and apply them in an exam scenario based on the information given to you in the scenario than just reciting or rote learning or cramming and writing everything about a particular accounting standard. Therefore, I'll tell you that just having knowledge of an accounting standard may not be sufficient to help you sit, write, and pass this paper. You need to have the application skill as well, not just the knowledge skill. You need the application skill to apply that knowledge to the information given to you in the scenario, such that you are able to address the question or the examiner's question. So rote learning is basically not going to be your help. Rote learning is cramming. So don't go in the exam thinking that, okay, I remember this standard called I-36, it's the payment of assets, and in there we talk about recoverable amount, and recoverable amount is about value in use and, uh, net, and, and fair value, less cost of disposal, and then uh, you actually talk about it in terms of either an individual asset or a cash generating unit, and therefore if you are allocating the impairment loss in a cash generating unit, it's about goodwill first, and then the other assets on a prorata basis, please, that rote learning is not what will help you. But how do we, if you wrote all that when the scenario is actually about maybe a particular asset and you're starting to talk about the allocation of impairment loss in a cash generating unit, when this is one particular asset that the examiner is asking about in terms of its impairment, you are not hitting the point and you are not earning the mark. In any case, you are wasting the time, which would be very important to write sense in this exam and to be able to impress the examiner to give you your marks. So therefore, you need to be aware of the different accounting perspectives, even for a public sector entity. And this paper covers public sector entities as well. Please, meaning at this point, you need to also be able to know which equivalent IPSAS goes for this IFRS when it comes to the pub public sector setting. Please remember that uh, in the public sector, we use IPSAS, International Public Standards, uh, 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 Standards of Accounting, sorry, International Public uh, uh, st uh, Statements of Accounting Standards. So you're using those IPSAS and those IPSAS basically are bent on or are actually developed from IFRSs, but they are restructured or reorganized to actually suit the uh, public sector environment. So it's important for you to know, you don't have to quote the standard number or the title for you to actually be able to pass them, uh, to get the mark, but the principle in that standard and applying it to that public sector accounting transaction is what the examiner is interested in. You may at this point have a list of the IPSAS and across them is actually the equivalent IFRSs. Maybe you're talking about IPSAS 17, which is about property, plant and equipment, which is having the equivalent of IAA 16, which is also property, plant and equipment. Or you're actually talking about uh, uh, IPSAS maybe uh, 21. Uh, and by the way, some of these IPSAS basically may not even have an equivalent IFRSs. So, there are IPSAS, not very many, who's, uh, where they are not beg pegged on IFRSs because this is a particular aspect which is only in the public sector. So, uh, so you may, for example, have the impairment loss for the non-cash generating assets. 
So that is actually going to be an Ipsos on its own, which you may need to actually be well equivalent with. So in this paper, there's always going to be a question on public sector entities. And that question usually will be in section B, but it's very important for you to have that overview and that good grip on how do we deal with accounting for public sector entities. Now, therefore, in this question, in this paper, you need to be able to explain why and how an accounting treatment is actually going to be applied and why you are using that accounting principle in the context of the scenario or the context of the information within the scenario. So every point you make in this paper, you are earning a mark. And that mark is only on the basis that you have well developed it or you have developed and explained it appropriately. For example, you've explained why and how that accounting principle applies to that information content in the scenario. To that extent, the person marking your script and the examiner are very confident of giving you that tick and that mark that goes for that. Otherwise, I will also tell you that over relying on just one single source of information may not actually be very helpful. Not to say that don't actually get to that one source of information, but it's important to diversify, to enrich yourself by looking at different sources and complementing your knowledge from these different sources. So one single textbook will not actually be very Import it's good, but you need to enrich that knowledge if you can actually complement it with maybe looking at another. For example, you know you have materials on the ICPAL website. It's important at this level that you can complement those materials with also materials on other accountants and professional websites in that same topic. For example, it's not very hard or very terrible for you to even access materials from say SCCA on the same topic under this the, in the on the same topic that is covered by the equal materials but also your tuition provider has a lecture notes or lecture notes which is also providing you on the same topic so the more you have these different uh materials on that topic the more you get that grip to understand and appreciate the issues around that topic and therefore to get the confidence to apply them in the context of the information given to you in the scenario. Just imagine that kind of confidence and that kind of happiness you're having in the exam while you're writing on a topic that you feel that you have enough and vast information over. So it's important that you widen your scope of knowledge or widen your scope of the information content that you're picking from. But again, in this book, in this paper, you are going to have questions which will also require you to do calculations. So recall that it's both, it's a technical paper that has both the technical content that is narrative and where possible calculations. Like that question one on group accounts, you cannot run away from calculations. But even the section B or other questions that are narrative, the question may ask you that include calculations or support your explanation with calculations. Please, when you're making these calculations, ensure that you are actually providing relevant calculations tagged to the amount of the marks that are, like, are linked to that calculation. Now, very important to read the scenario before you rush to actually write. So if I was a student then, or as a tip to you as a student, whichever question you're doing, first go and read the requirement. Read the requirement, take your eyes quickly to the requirement. In the requirement, pick two things. Pick the instruction and pick the content of that instruction. So the instruction can be explained, or the instruction can be discussed, or the instruction can be outlined, or the instruction can be state. So that's the instruction. Understand what you're going to do. Are you going to explain? Are you going to describe? Are you going to comment? Are you going to discuss? Are you going to state? Are you going to outline? But what are you outlining? What are you discussing? The content. I'm discussing the recognition requirements for deferred tax, for the deferred tax implications. So that content. So if the first thing I do is to read the requirement picking the instruction and the content then the second thing i do is to come and read the scenario looking out for that item that has the fat tax implications which i need to go and explain or discuss when i do that it means that it becomes easier for me to map out or to 
pick out the key information in the scenario that I need to discuss about in respect of the requirements. So that's very important as a student in this particular uh, paper. Otherwise, it's also important that while you're writing your answer, structure your answer and present it in a way that will enable the person who's marking your answer, understand and follow through logically how you are actually dealing with the answer to earn the marks very quickly. Others, yes, ICPAL marking process is very robust. They will still be able to attend to even the minute, those very small, small details, or even a way a student whose answer is so mixed up but please ensure that you smoothen that process. And I'm talking this from a, a fact that, yes, I know students of different versions. There are students who will actually amass or put details of a paragraph that is a full page. And that paragraph has too many all things mixed up in there. And yet this person marking your script is looking for the key points in there. And he has to take the trouble to actually look out for those uh, information to be able to keep giving a tick for that information in such a congested kind of detail, in a congested mixed up kind of detail. So if you can start each point on a separate paragraph, that is good thing, a good tip. So the good tip is that everyone you have a new point to make, start it on a fresh paragraph or a new line. So then this allows the person marking your, your paper that is a appreciation and understanding uh, in the way you are logically flowing your, your answer. That will actually help, help you to earn or help the process of marking, but that does not mean that equal will only attend to only scripts that have actually been prepared in that manner. They are so robust. The marking process actually attends to the minute detail. So they attend to all the details, but help them as well to ensure that it actually puts you in a very better, comfortable position. It's also important that you answer all the parts of the question. I know that there are questions that have a part A, part B, part C, or even part A1, part A2, and there's, there can be a tendency of students getting a little bit hooked up and saying, oh no, I'm tired of this, or part A, B, C, D, let me go to another question. Please, you are actually starting to stand a chance of not passing that question or that entire paper comfortably. So there's a reason why the examiner has separated those parts, but all those parts add together to the full marks of that particular question. And if you attend and write all the parts, you stand a high chance of passing the paper. You stand a high chance of passing that question. You stand a high chance of actually confidently getting out of the exam room, knowing that you're not returning back to the examination room for the same paper next sitting. So answer all the parts of the, of the questions. It's also important that you apply the knowledge to the information given. I've already talked about that, meaning that you need to be very practical. Now, therefore, in the exam and on the exam date, it's important that you do the three things. One, you need to read through the facts, including even the question which you started with, reading the requirement and then through the scenario and ensure that all these facts are on your fingertips, the requirement and also the content. When you have read through and you've understood the requirements of the scenario, so the information content in the scenario, then in this case, you are now going to start planning your answer. You start planning your answer. As you plan your answer, you're thinking of the approach. Some of you have already picked on a strategy of how to answer particular questions in particular topics, perhaps based on your lecturers. Please stick to that strategy if that strategy works for you. Don't change it in this last minute. Mean that as therefore you are developing your answer plan, you're thinking of how to write, how much to write, and what to write in terms of your strategy that you have already developed. Then you write, while you're writing, please concentrate on your style of answering to ensure that you are addressing the examiner's requirements as directly as possible, rather than actually going around circles to come back to the requirement or to come back to answer the requirement. Please, your examiner and the marking team will only give you a mark and a tick to the very statement that you've given, which is key and very important to the answer and to the expectation of the examiner. So if you've written 20 sentences and it's only two sentences that make sense, the examiners and the markers will still go, have the patience to go through all the 20 statements, but pick the two that are important to be the ones where they will actually award you the marks. So concentrate your answer, therefore, in addressing that key requirement as directly as possible. 
It's important that you manage your time in the exam. This paper is actually a paper that requires a lot of time, good time management techniques. It's a paper that uh, requires uh, you to have managed your time well. And therefore, it means that as you actually prepare for this paper, look out for how many minutes do I have to answer a particular requirement based on the marking or the marks that are in there. So if your paper has three hours and 45 minutes and 15 minutes are basically to plan or to read and uh, go through the scenarios, then you are looking at maybe the three and three hours and a half to write or to read and write your answer. So in that particular case, you are going to look at those three hours and a half, making something like 210 minutes to earn a hundred percent. And you divide to say 210 minutes, divide by 210 minutes, divide by uh, 100. And what does that mean? It means that I'm looking at 2.1 minutes. So every one mark, every one mark to get 100%, I'm adding it in two minutes, uh, point one, or two minutes, let's say two minutes. Those two minutes imply that you need to use those two minutes to have read, to have read planned, and to have written your answer. So for every one mark you get, you are earning it in two minutes. That's to actually put you in a good planning, uh, whatever. So mean that if you're looking at a question that has 10 marks, there's a part of the question that has 10 marks, maybe part of the question says 10 marks, and each mark is earned in two minutes, then you are actually planning to use 20 minutes to answer that part of the question. Please stick to those 20 minutes in the sense that the moment the 20 minutes are finished, even if you still had more points to think about and write, move over to another question or to another part of the question. I will tell you from experience, Yes, that usually students tend to be more fresh and earn more marks or the earning capacity of marks is more higher and greater in the first minutes of attempting a question. While in the last minutes, as you continue with that question in the last minute, you actually start earning the marks, but in a very low pace because you are starting to get derailed. In any case, you're also starting to get impaired. You're getting tired on that question. So I'll tell you that the earning capacity is very high in the very first minutes of attempting that part of the question than in the last part of the minutes while you are still attempting that question. So if you've taken 20 minutes on a question of part A, and because you've not yet finished all the points you wanted to write, and you start debating with yourself that maybe let me give five more minutes to complete these remaining points, I can assure you the earning capacity in those last five minutes is very low compared to another student who has gone to another part of the question in those five in those five minutes that other student is earning higher marks and therefore that's where the difference comes in somebody has 48 percent another one has 52 percent and they all did the same questions the same two questions in section b and the same question in question one because one of them decided to actually go away from the time management strategy he continued five extra minutes on that part A, and he was only earning one mark in five minutes, while his colleague was earning three marks on the other question, which he has started. So I used to, I was a student, I used to stick to that time management strategy, that if 20 minutes are up on this question, even when in my answer plan, I have already put extra points, which I've not yet written, I would move over to another question. This time around in my mindset, thinking and planning that how much time can I save on this other question to ever use it again to the question I did finish. Because in the first minutes of this new question or this new part of the question, I'm more fresh to earn marks much higher than continuing with the old question where I am starting to even debate with myself that ah, now I have wasted the 20 minutes, I'm now getting to five minutes. Um, I earn? So you start debating and even having impressions and discussions in your mind about the five minutes you're starting to waste on something else. So on that same question, rather than going to another question. So I would emphasize, stick to the time you've allocated to each part of the question and don't go beyond, move to another question the moment that time is up for that question. Now, for you to do that, I can assure you, you'll not practice time management on the exam day. You need to start now. 
if you've not yet started before. And for me, this is how I used to do it. I would get two past papers, especially in the last three weeks to the exam, and I would stick my guts, or I would actually put my emphasis on those two past papers. I would write the questions in the two past papers, based not on known content, but also time management. I would time myself, in other words. The first time you attempt it, I can assure you, your time management will be very poor. If you go by that approach, if you're saying that on the exam day, maybe in the next two weeks from now, the real live exam, I need to ensure that I'm good in time management, start now. Get a past paper. Use that past paper and write to manage the time. Of course, you're also writing to see whether you're good enough on that topic, but also manage the time. When you try it out now, under the uh, and put yourself in an exam environment. Don't actually go in a situation where you're saying that, no, I am okay. Nobody is telling me stop. You stop yourself. I will tell you that you are not going to do well for now because it's the first attempt. Over time, if you try it again, the same question paper, the same question, two, three times, by the time you're on the third time or fourth attempt, you realize that now you are good. You are able to only use 20 minutes on that part that has 10 marks. On the live exam date, it's going to be a joy because it's going to be another day. It will be your fifth trial, but this time around on the real past, on the real exam. And you realize that your time management skill will be very good. Please, it is poor time management that is one of the factors that people are not passing the paper. It is not because people don't know the principles of the accounting standards, but the problem is time management. The examiner will have put up a question which has been assessed before the question comes to the student that it can be worked within that time that is allocated for that question. So it's up to the student to mismanage the time because the examiner knows very well with all the knowledge and experience of a student's environment, not even the examiner's environment, that in the context of a student's environment, yes, 20 minutes are enough for this part A, which has 10 marks. If the student is wasting 30 minutes on that question, it is because of the student's poor time management and poor planning for this paper. So start now. I will again emphasize start now to practice on time management. So don't use the very fine exam date to start practicing on time management. So I'm going to use the next bit of my presentation to go into summaries of the accounting standards or summaries of the topics that you have done, but key topics of this syllabus. In this case, I will actually be linking them to the questions that we are going to practice. And these questions, I'll be picking them from the past paper exams. While I do those questions, please look out for the things I'm going to do there. One is that I'm going to actually be giving you the tip on how to address that question. And that tip is the tip you're going with up the exam date. Secondly, I'll also be pointing out what in the past, and especially from the examining team, have been issues or shortfalls or challenges of students failing to write in that topic. Because if that topic is the topic coming back in your exam, you don't want to be part of that comment from the examiner that students have failed and have continued to fail to write or to appreciate how to write this kind of a question or this kind of a topic. So that's the instance of today's revision. You're complementing this with your tuition provider's revision to have that confidence by the time you get in the exam. Okay, so the information in front of you is basically our content, our uh, contacts, just in case you ever want to uh, access us and uh, you want to be supported. So otherwise, at this moment, I'm moving on to a document that has uh, summaries that are very key and important to your paper. Now, these summaries are based on what your exam, sorry, your tuition providers have already been providing to you, but also the materials you're accessing from wherever you're accessing them, including the ICPAL materials on the ICPAL website. So here I'm just summarizing them. So this information, you have them 
in the different sources of information you have from the books of uh, uh, ICPAL, from the uh, lecture notes of your tuition providers. I'm just picking them and also summarizing them for you, just to help me have them as talking points in this presentation today. Now, one of your key topics in this paper is the conceptual framework. That conceptual framework is a yardstick or is a feeder to so many or almost all the accounting standards. And in this paper, this paper is a paper that links IFRSs of uh, different IFRSs, including even linking IFRSs to the conceptual framework. I believe at this point you're very aware of how strong and important the conceptual framework is in terms of financial reporting, but also in terms of feeding and linking or relating to the other accounting standards. Please remember, a conceptual framework is not an accounting standard, but it guides the International Accounting Standards Board in developing those other accounting standards, which we call the IFRSs. While I look at this, I'll tell you that one of those standards I'm going to directly link it to will actually be IFRS 13, which we call fair value measurements, because that's one of the concepts that the conceptual framework actually deals with, the fair value measure as a concept. Now, in this particular topic, well, before even that, I want you to be very aware that the conceptual framework was recently revised. The revision took stages and, and, and years, but finally the output was completed by 2018. So in 2018, we were able to get a revised conceptual framework. That revision of the, that revision of the conceptual framework is now the yardstick under which the International Accounting Standards Board is also revising all these IFRSs to ensure that the two marry, the two link, the two relate, the conceptual framework and those IFRSs talk to each other directly. So I am very sure that you are also aware that within the conceptual framework, we actually are talking about the general purpose financial statements and what is the objective of the general purpose financial statements. The objective of the general purpose financial statements is to support especially those users that are capital providers to the company's resources with information or financial information that those users will use to make decisions. Decisions like, should we invest by buying shares in this company? Or should we invest by providing a loan to this company? Or should we invest by giving credit as a supplier to this company? I mean that these users are very importantly looking for this financial information. And so the conceptual framework gives that objective of why do we have financial reports? Why do we have general purpose financial statements to prepare to the public for the public's use, where those users are? I'm very sure you by now you know that these users of the financial statements are under two categories. There are those we call the key primary users, and there are those we call the secondary users. The key primary users of financial statements are the capital providers to the company. They provide either equity capital, like the shareholders, or they provide debt capital, like the loan providers, and either they are existing shareholders or debt holders, or they are potential shareholders or potential debt holders, but they are key primary users of the financial statements. The secondary users of the financial statements will be the others, including people like the employees, who are looking at those financial statements to assess how they've contributed or how much they've contributed to the financial performance of the company, specifically for their job security. Is this company financially stable for the coming years and liquid enough to ensure that my job is still available, but also to earn a bonus? So they're looking at those as secondary users like employees or secondary users like maybe the government, which is saying that to what extent is this company and sector improving the economy of the country? And even then, what tax revenue do I expect from this company in respect of its performance and therefore the profits they've made? So those are categories of what we call the secondary users of the financial statements. Otherwise, I will tell you that the conceptual framework will always also talk about the underlying assumption under which 
financial statements are prepared. So underlying in the sense that that assumption is not clearly going to be written to say these financial statements are prepared on a going concern. No, it is implied, it's assumed that if I wrote, if I picked your financial statements, it's assumed that your companies are going concern. Even the basis for your preparation of the financial statements is going concern. That's why I should expect you to have non-current assets or even non-current liabilities, implying that these assets are going to be with you and you're going to use them and realize them for a period that is more than 12 months. Or non-current liabilities, implying that these liabilities, uh, liabilities are still your present obligations, but your settlement of them will be in more than 12 months from now. So you're such a going concern because you're expected to still operate for more than 12 months. In the event that the company is not certain of its going concern, then that is when the company must write it in the financial statements, either as a disclosure or not, because they are not certain, and they will give reasons why they are not sure of their going concern, or if they are actually breaking up or closing, then their basis of financial statements will not be going concern, but an alternative basis like a breakup basis. Now, the conceptual framework will be the one that will also talk about the elements of the financial statements or the building blocks. So all financial statements we have, and I'm sure at this stage you know that the financial statements will comprise of the statement of profit or loss and other compressive income, the statement of changes in equity, the statement of financial position, and the statement of cash flows, plus the accompanying accounting policies that come in form of explanatory notes. I'll tell you that those five elements, so those five components of financial statements will have five elements. I mean that in these five, five in these financial statements, you are reporting assets in there which is one element, you are reporting liabilities in there, you're reporting equity in there, you're reporting income in there, you're reporting expenses in there. It is therefore the conceptual framework that defines these five elements. Those five elements are assets, liabilities, equity, income, expenses. And it's again the conceptual framework that gives a recognition criteria on how I uh, which guides companies on how and where to recognize these items. Even then before that, that it, the recognition criteria on when do we recognize. So you don't wake up any morning say, I'm now recognizing an asset until that is a present economic resource that you as a company, you control as a result of a past event. That is when you'll ever say, I have a, 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 an asset which I'm now going to recognize. And you should know where to recognize it. It will be recognized in the balance sheet or statement of financial position. So that will happen for all the other four remaining elements that I cannot recognize a liability until I am certain that I have a present obligation. It's not, it should not be a future obligation, but it should be a present today. I have a present obligation and should not only be a present obligation, it should be, be manifested or coming from what we call a, a past event. So something should be pushing it to actually bring it to you as a present obligation and it will be you using your resources to settle that obligation. So in that case, then you have a liability to recognize and you know you should recognize it in the statement of financial position. So the conceptual framework therefore gives us that definition, gives us the recognition criteria and also the measurement, but the content in the financial statements is what the conceptual framework says should be very useful to those users that are going to use the information to make decisions. Remember, those users are going to be made up of the primary users and the secondary users. So the content in the financial statements should therefore bear characteristics that ensure that at the end of the day, the information you've given to these people is quality to support them to make decisions. It's quality in the sense that there are fundamental aspects it has. It has information that's relevant to them. It has information that has been faithfully represented to ensure that whatever they have is actually not on the quality, but it's appropriate. In others, faithfully represented. Otherwise, that can also be enhanced by those other characteristics. For example, comparability. So I can even be able to compare that information of this year against information of last year on a like for like basis because I've used similar and consistent accounting policies across the two years. But that information is also timely 
I've received it on a timely basis to support my relevance of the information. Otherwise, if you're giving me today information of five, 50 years ago, it ceases to be relevant because it's not timely. It's too old and outdated today. It cannot help me make a decision in respect of today and tomorrow. So it should be timely information and that information should be supportable. In other words, it's verifiable. I can verify it with the transactions that took place and the records that you actually have in respect of the fact that you are actually giving me information that's of substance, rather than, for example, legal form. So it's verifiable to support that faithful representation and it's even understandable. It's in clear, concise, and precise information or statements that I can read and understand, including the way it's classified. It's classified under liabilities or expenses, or even then separately as non current liabilities. So it's well classified, it's well presented, supported by disclosures to ensure understandability. So I'll tell you that financial statements must reflect the economic substance of the transaction to ensure that faithful representation at the end of the day, especially where that transaction or does that account balance has a substance nature which is significantly different from its legal form to ensure that true and fair positioning or presentation of that transaction always report its substance rather than reporting the legal form. So the conceptual framework is that very rich to the extent that it actually supports all the other IFRSs deal with the concepts of relevance and the concepts of faithful representation in terms of the accounting principles of those accounting standards. But before that, three very key important things about the elements of financial statements is the conceptual framework that actually tells us or defines them. It's the conceptual framework that gives us the general recognition criteria to say recognize that asset or equity or liability or income or expense on the when this has happened and recognize it in this place in the financial statements. Again, it's the conceptual framework that says that the moment you recognize and I'm very sure you are aware when I use that word recognize a transaction, I mean debit and credit. You're recognizing it in the financial statements because you've drawn a debit and a credit. That debit and credit must be followed with a value, a monetary value. So you're debiting PPE in the balance sheet and crediting maybe cash, but there's something called a figure, maybe 20 million. So that monetary value is what the conceptual framework says that I shall guide on the measurement basis that all other IFRSs shall apply specifically to their own items in terms of those measures. So under the conceptual framework, they will tell you that there will be four measurement basis. Those four measurement basis are going to be grouped under two categories. Either we are looking at historical cost or we are looking at current value. So historical cost to say that for me, I'm measuring this asset based on how much I spent 20 years ago to buy this building. That's a historical cost. Or, and perhaps you're adjusting it with depreciation over the 20 years, but that's still historical cost. Or I'm going with the current value of this uh, uh, building. Rather than 20 years ago, which is too long ago, I can go with, go with the current value of this building to measure and record it in my financial statements based on this building's current value, even if I bought it 20 years ago. Current value, for example, will include the current cost to say that if I bought this building, 20 years ago at 100 million francs, what is the current cost today if I'm to buy the same building? Maybe now the same building can go for 150 million francs. So therefore, I would restate my figure from 100 million to 150 million because I've adopted the current value approach in respect specifically current cost. Or I may say that, no, I'll not go for the current cost. I'll go for what I call the value in use. Because this building is mine, I have already bought it 20 years ago. I'm not buying another building. So why should I go for current cost? I can develop a policy to say that it's mine. I'm going to use it for 10 more years from now. And what will be the value in use with, for me for the next 10 years based on the cash flows I expect to generate from continuing to use this asset or building for the next 10 years? If I can determine those cash flows, the problem with that determination is that there's some subjectivity of the amount of cash flows and also some subjectivity in terms of determining the discount rate to apply. But anyway, I can still use it as an approach to measure and say that if I can get the present value of those future expected cash flows, then that is the value in use to me for this kind of building. And I use the value in use method to measure that building. Or I can say, I will not actually go for historical cost 
because I that is too, year, too many years I got outdated. It's not relevant anymore. I'll not even go for the current cost because I'm not buying the building anymore. I already have the building. I'm not even going for the value in use because it's so subjective to determine those cash flows and the discount rate, but I'm using the fair value. The fair value is the price I would sell this building and you'd go for the net realizable value to say, if I was to sell this building today in the market that has active market participants who are not forced to actually buy and I'm also not pushed or forced to sell. So it's an arm's length where we are willing buyers today on the measurement debt, the reporting debt, what would be the fair value? That value, that value is fair to this building. So the fair value of that building is this much. And I go for that to say that therefore I have this measurement concept. So under the conceptual framework, there'll be those four measurement bases. Either to use the historical cost or the current cost or the value in use or the fair value and all the other IFRSs will pick it from those four measurement bases to either have them as one or a mix. If you want to IS 16 PPE, property, plant and equipment, they will tell you that you have a choice. You can either use the historical cost and a cost model, or you can use the fair value uh, model, sorry, the fair value model under the revolution model. So either one of the two. If you go to a standard like uh, IS2, they will tell you use both. Don't use any one of the two. For them, IS2 is inventories. Inventories will say, always carry that inventory at the end of the year by looking at both the current amount, the cost, which is the historical cost, and the net realizable value, which is the fair value. <laughs> and take the lower of the two. So in that case, IS2 has picked on the fair value and the, uh, and the current cost and say, pick the lower of the two. Well, IS16 has said, pick one of the two. Sorry, use only one, not both use on the cost model or use on a revolution model. So I the conceptual framework is that very important to all the other IFRSs. Now specifically I513 will talk about that fair value. So everyone talk about fair value, which is picked from the conceptual framework. That fair value in totality. <laughs> Excuse me. So that fair value in totality is guided by a standard called I-513. So all standards that are using the concept of measuring their items at fair value will have been guided by the fair value measurement of I-513, except a few. There are standards that say, for us, we shall not refer you to I-513 for fair value when we can be able to guide you on our own fair value. A standard like IAS2 inventories will tell you that for us, we shall guide you on our fair value. Meaning that always when you are carrying inventory in the balance sheet, carry it at the lower of the cost and the fair value of our own fair value. And in IS2, they will give you the additional guidance of how to get that net realizable value. Or if you want to a standard like IFRS2, IFRS2 is share based payments. And at your paper, at your level, you actually, this is one of your st uh, standards. So share-based payments, they'll tell you that this is either an equity settled share-based payment or it's a cash settled share-based payment. Whichever it is, we shall strongly use our fair value. If it's an equity uh, settled share-based payment in form of a share option to a person that we are calling a, an employee, then it's actually going to be a fair value of those share options on the grant debt, the debt we have actually granted the share options to the person called the employee. So that fair value on that debt is what we got for. We don't tell you to go to look at the fair value of I-513. Or if it's cash settled in form of a share appreciation right, we shall go with the fair value of those share appreciation rights at the reporting debt to determine the fair value of the liability at each year end. So IFRS2 will tell you it's fair value. Otherwise, all the other IFRSs, apart from a few, will actually tell you that fair value in accordance with I-513. Now, when we talk about fair value in accordance with I-513, we'll look at fair value in the context of the price you sell that asset or you discharge that liability. In other words, the exit price when that asset is leaving the company or liability is leaving the company. So you put yourself in that perspective that if this asset was to leave the company today or liability was to be discharged, what will be the price in a market that has willing buyers and sellers, people who call market participants, be able to give? So that's why under I-513, fair value is based on the market perspective, not the entity specific value. 
So we don't go by saying that if I have this building, which is part of my asset and I want to run it at fair value, I don't go by saying, what would I want my fair value of the building to have? I'll look at what is the market willing to pay for this building based on the factors that actually determine this building. So it's a market specific value not an entity specific value. While you're picking it from the market, you also look at the nature of the asset. If that asset is a non-financial asset, you should not even go by your own use of the asset. If you're using that building as a school, yet in the market, that kind of building is always used as a hospital. We shall go with the highest and best use of that building in the market, which is a hospital building, and fair value it in the context of a hospital building, not the way you're using it currently as a school building. And that's why we shall look out for that principal market of that hospital building, rather than your own wish that I want to look for any market where they sell or where they can sell school buildings. It is the principal market. And the principal market is that market that sells the highest volume of such buildings. So that's the market that will tell me the price of such a building. If that market is not there, a principal market, which is very rare, then we shall go for the most advantageous market where I make or maximize more profit if I was to sell that building in that market, but still as a hospital building. So in that case, I will go for the most advantageous market. So I look at the nature of the asset. Is it a non-financial asset? Therefore, I look for the highest and best use, but in the principal market first, before I go to the most advantageous market. But even while I do that, I should ensure that I maximize the observable inputs and minimize my, the non-observable inputs. When I talk about observable inputs, I'm looking at those, that I, those factors that are clear, are supportable. So if this is a building, the observable inputs is what the market perceives to say it's a four, it's a building that has four floors, it has these 10 rooms, it has a very good gate, it has a very big compound. So those are observable inputs. The non-observable input inputs, which are assumptions. Non-observable inputs are usually assumptions of the management to say that I assume that this building, even if it has 50 rooms, it can be, it can, it can actually be uh, they can be uh, split out or they can actually be squeezed to make them 100 rooms. Those are starting to be non-observable. Nobody's seeing 100 rooms there. There are 50 rooms. So under IFRS 13, when we're dealing with fair valuation of those items, especially assets, we shall look at maximizing those observable inputs than uh, maximizing non-observable inputs in the process of getting that fair value. And that's why we have a hierarchy to say that, therefore, can you even start with the quoted price? Because that's more clear, it's more observable. If that building has quoted price in a principal market, then that price becomes the value of this building. Others, if that asset does not have a principal market where it's usually sold with a quoted price, then we shall look for another asset which is similar. If this building had five floors and there's another building that has maybe eight floors and in that market they usually sell a building with eight floors, then I'll go for level two, which is to get that other building which is a little bit identical and adjust it from eight floors to three to five floors. And in that case, I'll have used the level two, but still level one and level two are based on observable inputs. If I can't have those two levels, then that's when I go for the non-observable inputs in level three to say, fine, in the absence of all that, I can go with management's own subjectivity where management sits down with maybe a technical person like a valuer to say, I think this building, the way it looks and where it's stationed, I can actually give it this amount of money in that case, we have used the level three. So please, that standard I-5-3, sorry, I-5-13 is an overarching standard. It's a broad standard. It equips all the other standards that demand or talk about using fair value by giving it those principles. And even in those principles, they'll actually tell you that when you're determining those fair values, you are actually going to determine those fair values periodically, either each day or sorry, each year or every after years, but that will now be left for the specific IFRSs. A standard like IS40, investment properties, will tell you fair value is every year, every reporting debt for the investment properties. While a standard like IS16 will tell you that if you're using revaluation model, is regular. 
It can be every year, it can be two years, three years, depending on how and how necessary it is for the company and practical for the company to keep determining valuation for their property, plant and equipment. So IFR 13 just leaves the principle and it leaves the accounting standards to deal with it in a way that they find it more practical. Now, you also know that in this paper, you need to be very well equipped in appreciating, but also in ensuring that you can actually report a financial performance of a company. And here, reporting a financial performance of a company will ordinarily equip or will ordinarily require you to remember standards like IS1, how do I present that statement of financial performance, which is the profit or loss and other compensative income. But there's also IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers, to mean that in that statement of profit or loss, specifically one of the key highlights of ensuring or reporting financial performance is by reporting the revenue that company has made, and that will be guided by a standard called IFRS 15, or even IS2, whereby because I'm earning revenue, I'm earning revenue by selling goods, and those goods are what we call actually inventory. So reporting financial performance is one of the key concepts of a student doing this paper to ensure that at the end of the day, Technically, you can prepare financial statements by preparing the company's financial or presenting the company's financial performance in those financial statements, but you can also interpret them or explain them and help the person who's reading the financial statements understand the content and be able to make a decision in there. So IS1, for example, prescribes the content of that general purpose financial statement, but the main issue in there is not only to present, but also to help with comparability with the company's financial statements of the prior years or companies in the same sector. So the person who's reading your accounts is able to see a like for like or a unified kind of uh, presentation. Otherwise, I'll tell you that wrong or inappropriate accounting treatments can never be rectified or resolved by saying that since I'm not doing the right presentation of the financial statements, I'll go to the disclosure notes and explain or give the details there so that the person who does not see or understand the face of the figures of the financial statements will actually go and instead read the disclosure notes to understand that. So that is not where you are going to be able to resolve any omission or any misstatement you put on the face of the financial statements because the reader wants to understand the company's financial performance right from the face of the figures that have been put in there. Otherwise, under IS-1, as a rule of thumb, it is not acceptable to present your balance sheet where assets have been reduced by liabilities and say, this is the net figure, the net figure line by line, except where another standard allows you to do that. Some standards allow you to offset an asset by a liability and present the net figure. A standard like IS-19 employee benefits, rather than having defined benefit pension assets in one side and also defined benefit pension liabilities or obligations on the other side, you are allowed to offset and have a net figure which you call either a net defined benefit obligation or a net benefit uh, defined benefit pension assets. So IS-19 can allow. But IS-1 will not have allowed, but IS-19 will allow you. You will find standards like IFRS 16. IFRS 16 is leases. That IFRS 16 will not allow you to offset. If you are the lessee and you have leased an asset, and therefore you have to, a right to use that asset, you shall recognize that right of use asset in the assets, while the liability you have related to that asset or to that lease shall also be separately presented in the liabilities as a lease obligation. So IFRS 16 will be in agreement with IS1 that here for, for us, we don't offset. While, I, while, while, while your uh, IAS, even IS12, IS12 allows you, you can offset. If you have deferred tax, uh, deferred tax assets and deferred tax liabilities, you can offset them. And you have, if uh, especially if those temporary differences are coming from the same operating segment. If that same operating segment is the one that has assets and liabilities, which are bringing in temporary differences, some of them are taxable temporary differences, others are deductible temporary differences, we shall have the net temporary difference, and that net temporary difference will be the basis against which switch, we're having a net figure, maybe a defined, a defined, sorry, a deferred tax liability or a deferred tax asset. So some standards, yes, go in, in agreement with IS-1 to say, for us, we shall not offset, others say we can offset, but IS-1 in principle says never offset. Please don't offset incomes by expenses. 
to say that in my statement of financial performance, the profit or loss, I'm only presenting the net amount. No, except if another accounting standard allows you to offset. IS-20 can allow you to offset. IS-20 is on government grants. If you have a government grant, which is actually being matched with an expense, if it's a grant related to an expense, you can offset. And you offset to say that if this grant came in to support with salaries or employee costs, and you have expense already because you've paid the employee their salaries, then the grant comes in from the grantor, you can offset. IS-20 will allow you to offset. But if IS-1 will not have allowed until IAS 20 will have allowed you to do that. Now, at least when you're making your presentation of the financial statements in IS 1, uh, they will tell you that at least present one cooperative year. If today you're presenting 2021 accounts, you should have at least 2020. In that case, you are able to give a comparison to the reader who's got to understand where you've moved from. Have you improved in revenue? Or have you gone down? Have you improved in assets? Have you increased in assets? So he's looking at that. But in any case, if there's even a change in policies, because for you to compare like for like, it means that in those two years, you used similar accounting policies. But if there was a change in an accounting policy, then it will be required to actually make a retrospective treatment and go back and adjust those financial statements, especially the opening figure, to as if the change in policy was made in that prior year, or if it's an error, as if the correction of the prior, of the error was made in that prior period where the error was made. Please remember that uh, again, in terms of your uh, reporting the financial performance, you may have a case of a discontinued operation. Why? Because it's very possible that the board or management may make a decision to discontinue from a particular business line or to discontinue from operating in a particular geographical area of operation. In this paper, again, if that case comes, you should be very alert to know that I will always present the results from the discontinued operation separate from the results of a continued operation, normally in one line. The results from the discontinued operation will usually be presented as a single amount in that one line, and the details are going to be put in the disclosure notes. Otherwise, to the person reading your financial statements, who's assessing your reporting of the financial performance that or financial performance you've reported, he will be able to assess or evaluate and confirm that this amount of revenue, which used to come from this business line, is not expected to be in future. And that's part of the relevance under the conceptual framework, the fundamental characteristics. So you've provided him relevant information to help him predict that your next years will not have incomes coming from this business line because you're discontinuing from this business from this business line. So IFRS 5 is a standard that deals with the non-current assets sold for sale, but also the discounted operation. In there, we are basically looking at that particular operation that the company could have closed. Please remember that that operation must be a significant component of the company. So what does that mean? It means that if this company has five business lines, but it only closes a particular office and that business line continues to operate, so that business line is everywhere in Rwanda, maybe in 15, 15 districts of Rwanda. And uh, what they do is turn the close one of the five, 15 districts, but they continue to operate in the other 14 districts. That company has not closed the business line and that's not a discounted operation. That's a restructuring under I-37. I want you to remember your examiner is very tactical. He can give you a situation where 15 branches is what the company has, and this business line is operating in all the 15, uh, maybe the businesses to sell sugar, and they are selling sugar and maybe salt, and all sugar and salt is sold in each of the 15 branches, and they close one of the 15 branches, and that branch is not in one isolated region or one isolated district. It's a branch in a region or a district that has four other branches. So in that case, it's not even a geographical area that they are discounting from, they've discounted from. So please, that qualifies to be a restructuring program, which brings about a restructuring liability, which under IAS 37 provisions, contingent liabilities and assets shall be recognized as a restructuring provision on the extent that you have a present but constructive obligation supported by a detailed formal plan on how the restructuring is going to go about. And that is not even an 
enough, you should have announced it to all those that will be affected by that restructuring plan in respect of that branch, including the staff, including the suppliers, including the customers, to create a valid expectation from them that you as a company, you're going to discharge your responsibilities, especially where there's an implication of a cost on your side. For example, you will pay termination benefits to the employees of that branch you're closing, or you're going to refund or pay, compensate the suppliers who you had given contracts to, or you are going to compensate the customers who had given you an order and you had not yet delivered. So IA37 is that, not I5. I want you to be very mindful of where, what are the boundaries of these accounting standards. Otherwise, in terms of IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers, which is a very key standard in helping us report the company's financial performance, I'll tell you that you can never recognize revenue until all five steps have been satisfied. In other words, it's on a step-by-step -step approach. Even if it's one minute, let's just assume Today, if you go to buy sugar, a kilo of sugar, from a shop next to your house, in that day, by the IFRS 15 is for the person selling. In other words, the person earning revenue is the one who uses IFRS 15, not the buyer. So if you're the buyer right now going to buy sugar and you went to buy sugar in just one minute, you paid 2,000 francs and the person gives you your kilo of sugar. That person in one minute is going to go through the five steps to recognize his revenue. One is that he needs to identify the contract. That contract can be written, but it may be implied or verbal. In most cases, that contract, you're going to buy sugar from a shop next to your home is implied. It's not a written contract. In that contract, you and the seller have agreed to the terms. And the terms is that the seller uh, is available and ready to sell you sugar, packed in a kilo of one in a bag of one kilogram. While you, the buyer, you have accepted your obligation, which is to pay, and you carry away your sugar. So the terms have been agreed. But even then, the transaction is of a commercial substance. You're going to take your sugar and use it and benefit from having sugar at home, while the person who's selling you the sugar is going to benefit from earning the money from you to increase the sales or to even increase the size of his shop and to make profits and to survive. So I have identified the contract. In that contract, the terms have been clear and everybody knows what he or she is responsible for, including even the rights. The person who's selling you the sugar has a right to receive his money. While you've, uh, you're buying the sugar, you have a right to receive your sugar because you've paid the money for the sugar. So that's one step. The second step is that you, the person who's selling the, you the sugar, who is the seller, must have identified the separate performance obligations he has, especially if those performance obligations are separate. For example, he needs to package that sugar in a package that contains one kilo. He needs to ensure that that sugar is exactly one kilo and needs to pass it over to you. So those could be the separate performance obligations he has. Please, the performance obligations are on the seller part, part not on the buyer's part. Now, if I'm looking at a tuition provider like me as Innest Academy, and I'm teaching you as a student, you're my customer, I am the seller of the services. In that case, my performance obligations could be to actually provide tuition classes, the other obligation could be to provide you revision classes. The other obligation could actually be to give you the reading materials. Perhaps also other obligations like the classroom with a table and a chair and clean classroom. So those are other obligations. But I need to list out what are my performance obligations, me the seller of the service. Then thirdly, I need to determine the contract or transaction price. What is that contract price I have for the arrangement I have with you? What's that transaction price I have? If I'm charging you 200,000 francs for coming to, uh, to attend my paper, then to me, that's my transaction price. If that person is charging you 2,000 francs to take a kilo of sugar, that is his transaction price. So that transaction price is the one in step four I use to allocate it to those separate performance obligations that I identified in step two. So if me as a tuition provider, I'm giving you tuition classes, I'm giving you revision classes, and I'm also giving you the books or the materials, which are three obligations, and I'm charging you 200,000 for that package, then the 200,000 is the transaction price. I need to allocate it or split it 
into those three performance obligations in step four, but using what we call a standalone selling principle. So that standalone selling principle is going to allow me to prorate how much of the 200,000 do I put on tuition class? How much do I put in revision class? How much do I put in the materials or the book? that I'm giving to the student in a way that I perceive it from the fact that if this student came to me and said, I only want tuition class, or I only want revision class, or I only want books alone, how much would I charge that? Please, while I, I do the standalone selling principle, I don't perceive it from me, the seller. I should perceive it from the customer. Please, in the junior paper called FR, they don't go that extent. The student there is not expected to know what I'm talking. In AFR, the exam expects the student to know what I'm talking. There are two people in this contract. There's a buyer and the seller. When I'm dealing with the standalone selling principle, I need to look at it from the buyer's perspective. In Rwanda, do people only want, is there a case where people in Rwanda or students in Rwanda can only want tuition classes? Is there a case in Rwanda where students can want only revision classes for AFR? In Rwanda, is there a situation where students can only want to get books alone and they go and read on their own? If that is the case from the perspective of the customer, those students, then I say, okay, fine. If students in Rwanda can come for only tuition, how much can I charge them for only tuition? And therefore, those students are ready to pay that. If they can pay 120000 for tuition, then that's the standalone selling price for tuition. If there are students in Rwanda who say, for us, we only want revision because we can study and read on our own. And therefore, I say, how much do I charge to revision? And maybe it's 70,000. Then 70,000 is the standalone selling price for revision alone. If in Rwanda there are students who say, for me, I don't have time to go to a tuition provider, neither the interest of getting to sit in a class because I'm busy, I even perceive or I understand more when I read on my own, I only need the books. So please, Inest, I only want you to, uh, to sell me the books. Then in that case, the customer in Rwanda is willing to only buy books. So the question is, how much do I charge or do I price books alone? If the price is 50,000, then that's the standalone selling price for books. So we perceive it from the customer, but we, the seller, are the ones that are going to use that standalone selling price to allocate the other transaction price of 200000 on a pro rata basis, implying then when I'm allocating that 200000 which is the package I gave you, and that package, by the way, the transaction price can go on a discount basis, because if I'm giving you a package, I don't have to charge it by plus, plus, plus. That tuition is 120 plus revision is 70, which is 190 now, plus books is uh, 50, which is 240. So I cannot necessarily have to charge you 240. I could have actually okay, discounted it because you're buying it from me as a package at 200,000. But that 200,000 is what I want to allocate to these three uh, performance obligations by saying that on a standalone selling basis, if tuition alone was 120 out of the total of those items alone, which is 240. So 120 divided by 240 times this 200,000 is the amount that I'll allocate the transaction price to that performance obligation. I'll also do that for revision. That 70,000 is revision out of the total of 240,000 Time was this 200,000 is the price I'll allocate to revision. The books is 50,000 divided by 240 times this 200,000. I'll allocate that to the con to the materials. So in that case, I have gone into step four to allocate the transaction price to those separate performance obligations using the standalone selling principle as an approach. In that case, I'll go to step five to say I can now recognize revenue as and when I satisfy those performance obligations that I committed or was contracted to commit myself to my customer. When I'm recognizing this revenue, I'll say that some of these performance obligations could be or were satisfied at a point in time. Some of them were satisfied over time. For example, the giving books to the students was at a point in time. When you paid me the 200,000, I gave you the books either manually or I gave you the password to access the books. If that is the case, then the amount I've allocated, the 200,000 amount I've allocated to the books, I'll, the amount in the 200,000 I've allocated to the books, I'll recognize it immediately at the point I've satisfied my performance obligation 
which is to give you the password or to give you the books. And that will go to my uh, financial statements as credit in revenue. I'll credit revenue for the amount I've allocated the books. Remember, I received all the 200,000 from you. You pay this in advance. There are so many tuition providers who tell you, pay the money in advance. So in that case, I debited 200,000 in my cash and bank, but the credit is not all of it to revenue. If immediately I give you the books, I'll credit the amount I've allocated the books. But the tuition and revision, I'll have to credit it later. Why? Sorry, I'll credit it in revenue later. Right now, I'll credit it as deferred income. Please, in IFRS 15, they don't necessarily call it deferred income. They call it contract liability. So I'll credit that contract liability, which technically people want to call deferred income. And then as and when I satisfy the performance obligations, because tuition classes are performance obligations, I'm satisfying over time. I'll start washing or running or transferring it from the uh, contract liability account from the balance sheet to the P&L in a line called revenue using a percentage of completion. So that percentage will be how many classes, if the tuition classes are 20, but I've done so far five, how many of those tuition classes have I finished in percentage? So five out of 20 will give me the percentage, which I will now transfer from the contract liability to the P&L in a line called revenue. And I'll do that even for the revision classes later. So that's how we are structuring what we call our revenue. It's even very possible that you could even come to my class and I start teaching you before you pay. If you came and sat in my class and you've attended five classes out of the 20 tuition classes and I've not even given you an invoice, let's assume that I've given you the, I give you the invoice. Then that invoice I've given you for the five classes should give me what I call a receivable. So if when the seller makes an invoice or a bill for the work he has already performed, not the work he has not yet performed, but the work he has already performed, then the amount in that invoice becomes the receivable. Otherwise, if I have given you five classes and I've not given you the invoice, but I've completed the five classes and you and me are happy that the five classes out of 20 classes are finished, and to the extent of that percentage completed, that is a contract asset. So please, at this level, you should be able to define, to distinguish or separate a contract asset from a receivable. A receivable is supported by the invoice I've given you, while a contract asset is not yet invoiced, but I've done the work. Now, otherwise, I'll tell you that if you've even provided a warrant or a guarantee to say, you know, you see, if you come to attend my classes, I guarantee that you shall pass. If you fail to pass, you can come back and attend one other session free of charge. If this is normal, if this is a normal warrant or guarantee that every year I do that and it's everybody in the public that I can be able to do that, sorry, every person in the public can come to my classes and I give that guarantee that if you don't pass, you can come back for more classes on AFR free of charge, then that guarantee will actually be just part of what I'll account for in my revenue. But if this is a special guarantee to only you or beyond the normal guarantee, then in that case, that special guarantee will also go to a standard called IAS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities and assets to say that that guarantee, which is special, is going to determine or bring about a performance obligation on my side and that performance obligation to the extent that it has created a present obligation which is either constructive or legal i'll also have a liability that i'll put in the balance sheet waiting to see that you actually come and take over those special classes or additional classes otherwise in real sense and a warrant or a guarantee is normally in IFRS 15 going to give me another performance obligation to actually charge and allocate revenue to. Now, IS2 inventories by rule of thumb, everyone you talk about closing inventory, you should always carry it at the lower of its cost and the net realizable value. You examine at this level knows that from the junior paper FR, you know what constitutes cost for inventory. So inventory, the cost is not only the price you've, you've, pay, you've paid to buy the stock that you're reselling. It's even very possible that you have to convert that stock into sellable. So the cost is also the cost of conversion. Now, it's even very possible that that conversion is a long process, that by the end of the year, that product is not even yet finished because that 
conversion includes raw materials, includes labor, and there are some overheads in the factory to produce that inventory. So it's work in progress. So inventory shall be based on the cost you've incurred. So far, even if it's at a level of work in progress, compared to how much you can sell that item in that state, which is what will give us the net realizable value. Please, net realizable value, remember, in terms of IS2 is the price you can sell that item, less the incidental or the cost to sell to get that net realizable value. Now, biological assets are covered under IS41, where we talk about agriculture. Please remember at your level that biological assets under IS41 shall never include bearer plants. I, I'm hoping you remember that biological assets should be these items, and that's why they are unique, because they undergo a biological transformation. So an example could be plants. A plant grows, so it's biologically transforming by growing. An animal like a cow grows. If it's a calf, it's still a baby until it grows. So it actually transforms through a biological transformation process. That's why those, uh, those items or assets have their special standard, IS41, and they're not in other standards of assets because they have that uniqueness. They grow, they are living, they are living items. They grow. So, uh, so IS41 is dealing with items that are living items. They grow, and in that case, they are going undergoing a biological transformation. Now, however, if these items are growing and they are actually plants or in the form of plants and they are bearer plants, maybe I need to write it here for you to appreciate what I'm writing here, what I'm talking about. So here, I'm talking about a bearer plant. So a bearer plant implies that this plant bears fruits or bears something. An example is a mango tree. So if I am in an organized agriculture activity, by the way, this should be organized. For you to say I'm using IS-41, that agriculture activity should be organized. Don't just wake up to say, you know, I have some beans in my compound which I've grown on a small uh, piece of land which I'm actually uh, growing to eat. No, it should be unorganized. Those people with farms and that's their business registered so it's an organized kind of uh, activity in there so those are the ones that are saying that this bearer so this biological assets are under their eyes for the one so if this biological assets are bearer plants a company has plantations of mango trees and those mango trees they are actually growing mangoes which they are going to pick off the mango tree and squeeze into juice and these companies are in Yange. i'm giving an example I'm not saying that that's what Inyange does. Maybe Inyange has mango trees. It grows mangoes on acres and acres of land. When those mangoes are picked off, they are actually squeezed into mango juice and they sell us the juice, which is packed. Then in that case, those mango trees in those, in, in those gardens are called bearer plants. They bear mangoes. So they are plants, but they bear mangoes. Don't confuse it with milk. Let's assume that Tinyange also has milk and they have cows on acres and acres of farms. So those cows are bearing uh, milk because they squeeze milk out of them and they actually uh, uh, pack this milk and sell them to you. So yes, those are also biological assets, but those are bearer animals, not bearer plants. If these are bearer plants, bearer plants are only accounted for property plant and equipment under IS-16. So those ones, don't take them in IS-41. But all the others, if Inyange has uh, uh, cows where they're getting milk, those cows are bearer animals, those are IS-41. But if Inyange has mango trees where they are getting mangoes and those trees bear mangoes, then those mangoes are actually going to become the bearer uh, products which are going to be squeezed. So those are IS-16, those trees. Please, the mangoes is inventory only when they pick it off from the mango tree. When it's still on the mango tree, it's part of the biological asset or it's part of the uh, bearer plant, which is IS-16. So the milk of the cow is still part of the biological asset when still in the cow. The moment they take it out of the cow, on that very moment they are taking it out, out of the cow, it moves from biological assets under IS-41, it now becomes inventory IS-2 because they are selling milk or they are selling mangoes or they are selling mango juice. That is the inventory. But before it becomes mango juice 
or before it becomes mangoes or before it becomes milk for sale, it is still within the animal or within the plant or within it is. So it's still in the other context. Now, also remember that there are certain plants which are not bearer plants. Don't, they don't bear something that you pick off and the eye, that plant continues to exist. An example could be like a sugar cane. So if Inyange also has sugar cane plantations where they are actually getting sugar, let me, uh, uh, if you know of an example of a company that manufactures sugar, but perhaps it has sugar plantations. Those sugar plantations, the sugars, them, the sugar canes themselves are not bare plants because the day you go to harvest or take out that sugar cane, you take the whole root, you take all of it off. So you don't remain, it does not continue to bear more. It goes off. So in that case, that is IAS 41. So bearer plants are the ones that go to IAS 16, but the non-bearer plants continue to be IAS uh, 41. A non-bearer plant can include the same beans. Beans are non-bearer plants or maize because you go and take the whole of it out of the garden. So in that case, that is IAS 41. If the bearer plants are mango tree, you take off the mangoes and it continues to be there, that is IAS 16. So please look out, your examiner can confuse, so it can be tricky, not confused, can be tricky to bring you a situation where it's a bearer plant. Don't use IS-41. The reason why we separate is that IS-41 always demands to use fair value. So the moment I have a biological asset, every reporting date, it shall be assessed to fair value using i 13 fair value measurement. And that fair value means that any fair value gains or losses on a biological asset under IS-41 shall be taken to the profit or loss account. Well, if it's bearer plant and you're using cost model for it, you're depreciating it and assessing impairment loss. While a, bear, while a biological asset under IS-41 where you're using fair value and your fair value every year, please everyone you fair value every year, you don't have to have impairment loss or depreciation because that is already part of the fair valuation. Every year you have a new value including the fact that you've taken into account depreciation and impairment loss. While a revolution mode in I-16 where bearer plants are, you shall continue to depreciate or even applicable, you may need to do impairment loss. Secondly, even when you have a revolution model for these bearer plants in I-16, the revolution goes, again goes to other compressive income. And I-16 says you shall never classify it to the PNL. While if this is not a bearer plant, and it consists to be a biological asset under IS-41, the fair value gain goes to the PNL immediately. So please look out, your examiner is that very tricky. You can actually trick you with that kind of uh, information. So before I go to the next standard, I want to see if there's any questions in the chat room. Let me just go to the chat room and see if we have any questions in there. Okay, so somebody was asking uh, how to know these levels from one to three. I've mentioned those levels. That the moment the examiner says that this uh, company is using a fair value measurement principle from I-513 and says that uh, the value or the price of another asset quoted in the camp in the market, the one, the moment you see that word quoted, the price of another asset or similar asset, which is quoted, then that item has a quoted price, that's level one. And that is, the examiner can even tell you that this item is always sold in the market with a quoted price of 10 million. So the examiner has given you information taking you to level one. But if the examiner says that this item does not uh, itself have, uh, is not itself regularly sold in the market, but there's an identical asset uh, in the market with a price of 10 million, which if adjusted by the changes, significant difference between this item and that item, the, the price should be, uh, uh, so you can give you an adjustment, like say 20%. It means that he wants you to use level two, but adjust by saying that I'm only taking 80% of the other price of the other item. So in that case, it's still observable, but it's actually based on an adjustment in, in respect of the fact that there are those differences between this asset and the other asset, which is not typically identical. Otherwise, the examiner can say that uh, the company uh, does not have an active market for this asset, neither is there any market for assets of the same nature, but the management has decided or has actually based on support or based on assumptions, determined the price to be 10 million. So in that case, it's telling you it's level three. So that's how you'd know which levels eh, to use. The information in the scenario should do that for you. Another person is saying, this is Fiona asking that, how are these standards 
can be set like? How are these standards can be set like? I don't know what she wants to say. How are these standards can be set like? Okay, Fiona, you'll need to make it more clear. Even the way you hear me reading it for you, you also don't understand what I'm reading. So I don't also understand what you've written. How are these standards can be set like? Okay, maybe she'll clarify that. Then uh, Eric is saying, come again on difference between bearer plant and non-bearer plant. The difference is that bearer plants are not in ice 41. Well, non-bearer plants are in ice 41. Because non-bearer plants are in ICE 41, ICE 41 says every reporting debt, you shall use fair value because it's presumed fair value can always be determined for biological assets under ICE 41. And when you use fair value, the fair value changes shall always be taken to the P&L. But in the notes, you shall disclose the reasons for the fair value changes uh, in respect of physical change and the price change. That cow, which is a bearer animal, is under IS-41 and, oh, let me use the, uh, the non-bearer plant. A sugar cane, which is a non-bearer plant, uh, is in IS-41 and every year we shall assess its fair value using the fair value mode in IS-41 to say that this year, in 2022, this uh, value of this uh, sugar cane is now 20,000, while last year it was 10, uh, 12,000. The reason the fair value gain of eight, I will take it to the PL, but in the notes, I will split it to say that the reason for this increase from 12,000 to 20,000 is because of two reasons. One, one of them is physical change. The sugar cane is bigger than last year because it has grown bigger. So we call that physical change. The other reason is price change. The price of a sugar cane this year is different from last year. So that's the other reason. So the 8,000 in the disclosure notes should be split into the price allocated to the physical change and the price allocated to the price change. So please, uh, Eric, the whole thing is to know some plants are bearer plants, other plants are non-bearer plants on the basis that to what the word bear is they bear fruits. And then you come and pick off the fruits and that plant continues to be in there to give you more fruits next year, like a mango tree like a uh, apple tree, like a uh, 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 orange tree. It will continue to give you more fruits every year. But a sugar cane, the moment the sugar cane matures, you take it off and you plant more su new sugar, new sugar canes. The moment the beans are, uh, have, are ready for harvesting, you take them off and you plant new beans. But that's not what you do for mango trees. You don't say, now that I've picked off the mangoes, let me kill the mango tree and plant a new mango tree. No, those are bearer plants, they bear mangoes and they continue to be there. While non-bear plants, you actually take them off immediately. You have harvested and plant new ones. The non-bear plants are under IS-41. You value them to fair value every year. The bear plants are under IS-16. You don't go for revolution model, except if you satisfy the conditions. Usually IS-16 goes for the cost model. For the non so for the bear plants, because they're under IS-16, under cost model, you depreciate them every year. And if possible or where applicable, you assess them for impairment losses, which is not what you do for the non-bearer plants because under is 41, when you're using fair value, you don't depreciate, you don't assess for impairment loss. Another student is saying, this is Bosco, can you use example of how to treat IS-41? I think I've used them. I've talked about how to treat IS-41 uh, biological assets in terms of fair value and accounting for them. And you also present them in the balance sheet under non cash assets, but usually based on fair value. In the absence of getting their fair value, you actually go for the cost model. Another student, this is Fiona, says, I mean, how are they settled in set in exams? Oh, Fiona's making it clear. How do they set uh, how do they set uh, standards in the exams? Past papers, Fiona, you must be having past paper questions. They are easily downloadable on the equal website. The papers are there. So you'll see how they are setting. But I can project for you. Let me project for you. So this is a past paper exam. The one I've projected there, that sitting was August 2021. So in August 2021, you'll see the requirements. So you'll see, uh, you see the requirements, prepare a statement of profit or loss. So I want the one that has specifically indicating even the accounting standard uh, that you need to use. So let me go to section B. So uh, let's go to, so even this does not spell out, but this I know it's a, an accounting standard like IS-19. 
but let me go to another question where you'll actually see they are saying that in accordance with this accounting standard, some that don't even spell out the standards because there are more than one standard to use. So you see, so here, Fiona, they are telling you that using the indirect method, prepare the consolidated statement of cash flows for Big Rimana Group for the year ending the 30th November 2020 in accordance with the requirements of I7. So that's how they say it. So mean that you go and use the indirect method in that accounting standard. The, so the instruction is to prepare. So you go and prepare. What are you preparing the content? You're preparing a statement of cash flows. So there you are. So, uh, or let me pick another uh, another paper, like said December. So that Fiona says, if you've not been going through Fiona, you have only two weeks to your exam. Eh? If you've not, not been using these past papers, you need to get quickly that habit of using the past papers. Eh? So you see this part B of this question. is saying that regarding additional information in note five on borrowings, provide a summary or summary disclosure notes in accordance with this standard. So that's how they say it. So the instruction is to know that you're going to provide a summary. What summary? The content is on disclosure notes. So that's a question in that setting. So, or, uh, or like a question number, so in question number two, so the question number two is also a multiplicity of standards. So they don't quote one particular standard. So other is, Yes, all these are basically linked to standards. Equity settled share based payment is I for S2. So these are I for S2. Or impairment loss is I36 or I for S9, depending on the type of asset that you are assessing impairment. If it's a financial asset, it's I for S9. If it's a non financial asset, it's I36. So that's how they set. I'm hoping that I've gotten your question, Fiona, I know. Because you're saying, how do they set those standards in the exam? So they give you the content, the scenario, then they give the requirement, and they want you to remember these things I'm talking about of the accounting standards to apply them in the context of the scenario. Then somebody is saying, how can we treat government grants received as to compensate us a loss suffered in the agriculture? Now, I'll tell you that uh, never account for government grants under IS20 when they relate to agriculture or biological assets. And this question is very nice from this person because at your level, your examiner expects you to know that if you receive a grant from the government, if the government says, I've given you land, a thousand acres of land to plant maize so that will increase on the maize or on the maize flower in the country, that grant is the land they've given you. So that's a grant related to an asset. So that land is I-16. So that grant related to an asset called PPE or land will actually go to IS-20, that's okay. But if the government gives you the real biological assets and says that I'm giving you these uh, animals or I'm giving you these plants and that is the grant, please that is not IS-20, that is purely IS-41. So a grant related to a biological asset directly is not guided by IS-20, but IAS-41. Purely in IS-41, you account for it as that biological asset. In others, you call it cows in your balance sheet. And when the debit is there, then the credit will be depending on your policy. Am I actually taking the credit in my deferred income account because I'm using the deferred income approach, or am I taking it to the uh, p and L? as income, if you can satisfy the condition that you've matched that income with the expense to which it relates. If that is the case, then in that particular case, you are going to continue with the animals as they are, because they are biological assets, in context of IS-41 and assessing them to fair value every year and recognizing that fair value gain or loss in the p &L immediately, but in the disclosure notes, splitting that gain into physical change or the gain attributed to price change. So if I read that question again, how can we treat government grants received as to compensate us a loss? Oh, yeah, here, yeah. you're even talking about a loss, yes. Again, this loss is related to the fact that you are involved in agriculture activity and the government is coming in to console you or compensate you for the loss because of bad weather. Let's take that example. If because of a bad weather, your plants actually died and the government comes in to compensate you and that grant is related to the fact that it's to support your agriculture activity, then that grant shall be accounted for in accordance with IAS 41. 
because that compensation is maybe the government is giving you new seeds, new seeds to plant again. So those new seeds to plant again are biological assets or new cows because the others died because of diseases or sickness. So those are biological assets and ice photo one picks them immediately and handles them from there on. Okay, so uh, I think I'm done with those uh, notes, so, so those charts. Let me go to IS8. Please, at your level, we don't only look at IS8 in the way students in FRA look at it. We also look at IS8 in a way that is challenging. In others, what is the appropriate accounting policy to apply to a transaction, even those transactions that don't have an accounting standard yet? At FRA, they can examine them. Let me give you an example. You've heard of digital finance. We don't have an accounting standard in our IFRSs to account for digital finance, including cryptocurrencies. I want to repeat, there's an emergence of high level digital finance, people involved in investments in Bitcoins, which come in form of cryptocurrencies. And if that is the transaction of that material value and size that the company is involved in because of the new investment wave where people are saying that we don't want to deal in hard currency, we want to deal in digital currency, then we need to account for that transaction as accountants in the company. The question is what accounting standard is available to help us to deal with that? Today, we don't have any IFRS, yet we need to design, we need to develop accounting policies for each transaction. Because we don't have any accounting standard, we shall ask ourselves two questions. One, why is this company holding Bitcoins? Why are they holding cryptocurrencies? There are companies that are holding cryptocurrencies for sale. You know, they can look like Forex bureaus. They buy and sell, they buy and sell, they buy and sell. I mean that for them, cryptocurrencies are inventories. Even when we don't have an accounting standard for these Bitcoins, then that company will use IS2 to account for their cryptocurrencies because the nature of the use of their Bitcoins is to actually buy to resell, buy to resell. So they're inventories. So we shall go to IS2. Otherwise, if that's not the reason why we are holding Bitcoins, maybe we are using them as reserves so that we, we don't want to hold our money in cash form or in actually hard currency form, but rather in digital form, then in that particular case, we shall say that they are not, they are not physical. I can't see it, I can't touch it. So they can't be my PPE, even when I'm holding them as assets. So in that particular case, I am now, now going to look at the nature. The nature is that these Bitcoins, are intangibles because I can't see them, I can't touch them, but because they are intangibles, even if they are of monetary value, because under intangibles, it should be a non-monetary item, but I'll say it's more closer to use and classify them as intangible assets. Because in any case, I can have them identified, you know, I started eight intangible assets, says that for you to say you have an intangible asset, three things must be in place. One is that it's identifiable, Identifiability here means that you can separate it and you can decide to sell it on its own. So can I separate this digital finance? If I am badly off and I need money, can I go and trade in it? And somebody called a commercial bank gives me hard currency because the customer wants, sorry, the supplier wants me to pay him hard currency. So it's identifiable. Secondly, do I have control over it? Because that's the second condition in I-38. Do I have control over it? And I-38 says control in I-38 is usually seen or supported by legal enforcement. That's why in I-38 intangibles there, like license or copyright or royalties, you can legally enforce it. If somebody uses your copyright, you can go to the court and actually, uh, and actually have him charged. So if these are my Bitcoins, then it means that anybody who uses them is actually stealing and fraudulently acting. I can take him to court. So Bitcoins have that control element. I legally control them. They are mine, they are in my names. Thirdly, do I expect future economic benefits to flow to me? Yes, when I translate them into cash, perhaps even translated with gains, then in that case, yes, future economic benefits will flow to me. So Bitcoins to a company which is not holding them for trading purposes to buy and sell can actually be presented and accounted for similar to I-38 intangible assets. Otherwise, if I still fail to get which accounting 
standard is closed as my accounting policy to account for bitcoins, I can now go to the conceptual framework, which is always the last resort to help me out. So in your paper, dealing with ICE 8 accounting policies is bigger than FR, where for them, they don't extend it to those extra current issues. I'm hoping you're, here, you're able to understand what I'm trying to say here. So the examiner here is so flexible and open-minded to say that ICE 8 is not directed the way you've seen it in the, in, the row, in the books, but I want you to apply it to select an appropriate accounting policy for the transaction called Bitcoins of this company and explain why or defend why you've picked that accounting policy. So therefore, in ICE 8, you must actually be able to come up with reasons why you are selecting a particular accounting policy. If that transaction is a transaction that relates to an existing accounting policy, well and good, go by that policy. Otherwise, if it does not have an accounting policy existing for that transaction like digital finance or cryptocurrencies, then management shall use judgment, but supported by available conversions or practices or accounting principles to be able to determine which suitable accounting policy to apply. When management chooses the accounting policy to apply, say, for cryptocurrencies, they shall choose that accounting policy that shall be able to present or to provide reliable and relevant information to help the user make the right decision. Please, in this paper and throughout the course, never confuse an account, a change in accounting policy with a change in an accounting estimate. One is that a change in accounting policy is not supposed to be done every day. It's not common, it's not regular. Yet a change in an accounting estimate is done every day or regular whenever there's additional information that makes you or gives you a position to change the estimate. It's on that basis that therefore we shall say a change in an accounting estimate is not a change in policy and it's not even a correction of an error. So last year, if you're depreciating your asset based on an estimated useful life of five years, it is because that was the information you had last year. If you have had a better environment, economic environment, or a better usage of this asset that has improved its lifespan from five years to eight years, and you're starting to depreciate it over eight years, you have not done that because last year you're an error, you have depreciated over five years. That is what you had last year. Today, the asset is better because you've modified it. It's not even a change in policy because the policies you're depreciating both last year and this year, so the policies to depreciate. A change in estimate can be done so regularly. Therefore, don't expect that a change in policy shall be done every now and then. The moment you have selected that accounting policy, therefore, you must use it consistently, except where, and those are the rare cases, where the accounting standard has changed, either because it has been revised or it has been dropped. On 1st January 2019, we had a new accounting standard coming in for leases. And that replaced another one that was there, which was odd called IAS 17. So all the lessees who had accounted for their assets or leased assets using IAS 17 had to change mandatory wise from 1st January 2019 to IFRS 16 to apply a single accounting model we now have under IFRS 16 for leases. That is not every day. If you hear me well, I'll tell you that that change in I-17 came after so many years because they started attempting to revise. The ISB started attempting to revi revise I-17 all the way back from 2002 up to 2019 is when we got that new standard after 17 years. If you remember IFRS 9, which is financial instruments, it has had phases of revisions for over 10 years until when it was finally cleared and completed. So mean that people used to use IAS 39 until IFRS 9 came after more than 10 years. So on that day, people were supposed to change from what they were presenting in I-39 to IFRS 9. It's not every day. Therefore, the moment you are to change an accounting policy because of two reasons, either because it's mandated due to a new standard 
or a revision of a standard, or it could be the second reason could be because you're doing it voluntarily in order to provide information that's more reliable and relevant, you must, where applicable, apply a retrospective treatment, especially for a voluntary change. Please, we don't apply a retrospective treatment for changes in estimates. I'm trying to give you, in AFR, they give you a scenario where you are trying, where you are making that difference between a change in accounting policy and a change in an accounting estimate. So changes in estimates can be done regularly and they're understandable and therefore normal. Changes in accounting estimates can raise eyebrows of the auditor. Why have you changed your accounting policy? If you want to hear me and uh, to get me under well, understand me well, I'll tell you that accounting policies is what you see people calling financial manuals. So you don't every day go to the office to say, why, where is the new man, uh, uh, finance manual which was changed yesterday? And then tomorrow, another one which was changed also yesterday. So you, it can take even more than five years for a company to revise finance manual or even one element in the finance manual. And it will even require the board to approve that change. But accounting estimates are changed very regularly and therefore it's very normal. And because of that, changes in accounting estimates, you don't go back to those years, it will be too much work. In any case, it's not a change in policy, it's not a correction of error. So you only change the estimate in the year of the change and account for that change in the year of the change and prospectively in future, if the change in estimate will impact on the future years. Okay, so I'll therefore tell you that when we have a change in an accounting estimate, it's done prospectively. But a change in an accounting policy, we shall do it retrospectively by adjusting the opening balances of that asset or liability that's relevant due to that change. And uh, in that, in that adjusting the opening balance, you are restating the opening balance through what we call a prior year adjustment. And also adjusting the related item in equity, usually retained earnings with that opening, sorry, that uh, prior year adjustment to adjust the opening balance. Your examiner expects you to know that principle and apply it in the scenario. The examiner's scenario gives you a situation of a change in an accounting policy. I want you to think this and think, uh, think as if, put yourself in the examiner's mind. And that's why usually in revision, I ask my students to read the examiner's mind. The examiner can give you a situation of a company ABC Limited. And this company ABC Limited has ordinarily or has PPE, whereby in this property plant and equipment for years, this company has actually been carrying this uh, PPE under cost using the cost model. And this company this year has decided and approved to have the PPE revalued in order to provide up-to-date relevant figures on the PPE. Secondly, this company, in addition to revising the values, so the values of the PPE based on a revaluation, the company has also revised or reviewed the useful life of the PPE from maybe the 20 years to maybe five or 10 years, as, and they think that's more appropriate. And in that case, the company has also changed the method of depreciation from straight line method to reducing balance. So the company has done three things and that's what your examiner can formulate in a scenario. Then he's asking you advise the directors of this company on the accounting implications of those three changes in accordance with the applicable accounting standard. Now he's not even mentioning which accounting standard. Please, some of those are changes in policies. The policy was to use cost model and carry the assets at cost, they've changed that policy to revalue that asset, to therefore carry it at revalued amount. The policy is to depreciate, but they've changed the method of depreciation. From straight line to reducing balance, they've not changed the policy. The policy is to depreciate. They've only changed the method and the rate. The rate is the years. So in that case, that is a change in an estimate. So you're advising the directors that because this is a change in policy and this is a change in estimate for change in policy where applicable, if practically you can go back to the years back, you shall also do a retrospective treatment. If it can't be, then you shall disclose that fact in the notes that you can't do the retrospective treatment. We shall go with the figures this year. Otherwise, for the change in estimate, we shall not go back. We shall only change and start depreciating based on this rate or this number of years from now onwards. Okay, so 
again, as I complete that topic or area, I want to see if I have any comments. So some student is uh, asking, uh, means that those that those cows, Grant, you'll treat them as ice 41. I mean, how you treat ice 41. Okay, Dingo, I still not understand the question, but um, means that those cows, granted, I think, you'll treat them as ice 41. Yeah, there you okay. Mean, how you treat ice 41. I've been talking about how we account for ice 41. Use the fair value method every year. You actually fair value, fair value gains and losses taken to the PL. Uh, but in the notes, you go and say how much of that is physical change, how much of that is price change. In the absence of fair value, which is very rare, use cost model, whereby in cost model, you assess for impairment losses, if any, and you depreciate those animals, uh, but only if it's cost model, because cost model is not predominant in ice 41. You'll have defined companies that say, we have animals or cows and we're depreciating them. Usually they'll carry them at fair values. So that's the match, Molingo, on uh, how to treat IS-41. Eh? So I'm hoping you don't, I don't know what else you want. Somebody is asking how to treat IS-41. I'm repeating myself, maybe for a fifth time on how to deal with IS-41, fair value, fair value, fair value, change P and L, that change in the face of P and L in the notes, break it into physical change and price change. Please, it's the same. I'll sing it a hundred times. It's the same that the examiner will ask. <laughs> okay. So I want to propose a short break of maybe about 10 minutes at this point. Then uh, we come back and continue with our summary. And uh, this time around, we should also be looking out for uh, some of those that have questions. Eh? But I'm going to leave the face in front of you to actually look at just the summaries of non-current assets. Non-current assets here will have uh, uh, tangible and intangible assets. Tangible assets, including PPE, property, plant and equipment, including investment properties, IAS 40, uh, or even then non-current assets held for sale under IFRS 5, but also intangible assets like I-38, all uh, those are under that area called non-current assets. Okay, so let's have a 10 minute break at this point and then we resume after.
Okay, so we can resume and uh, I want us to now look at non-current assets. Now, typically each exam in this paper, AFR, shall have a question, if possible, even more than one question with an aspect of a non-current asset in there. Most commonly an item of property, plant and equipment, but it can stretch to other non-current assets. Please here, uh, this non-current assets will be or can include uh, non-current assets like even investment properties. They can include intangible assets. They can even strange, stretch to non-financial, uh, sorry, to financial assets because these are uh, non-financial assets, the one I've mentioned, but we can even stretch to financial assets under IS-41 or sorry, under IFRS 9, or even to uh, investments, which are basically going to be the route to investments in equity instruments, which are going to be the route to your group accounts. So in any case, in any paper or any setting uh, of this nature, AFR, you shall expect non-current assets to be within the question or within the scenario. One typical common one is the property plant and equipment. Please, I want you to know that when we talk about property plant and equipment, the key issues we look out for there are basically three mainly. One is recognition of PPE. Secondly, and the opposite of recognition is derecognition. Secondly, measurement of PPE. Thirdly, disclosures relating to PPE. Now, I'll tell you that you can never recognize PPE, if I start with recognition, without that PPE. In other words, you can never place an item of PPE in your financial statements if that item has not satisfied two conditions in IAS 16. One is that it must be probable that future economic benefits associated with that item of PPE shall flow to the entity. Secondly, its measure must or cost must be reliably made. So we should have a reliable measure of that PPE. So that reliable measure is what takes me to the second, which is measurement. And I'll tell you that that PPE is initially measured at cost. So in the exam, know that that cost, that initial cost of a PPE is made up of a purchase price. In other words, if I've bought the asset, or if I've not bought the asset, I could have constructed it. So it's going to be the self-construction cost, but plus the direct transaction costs. So if there are any transaction costs I've incurred, for example, I had to go through a lawyer to get with the, to help with the contract to get me that asset. Or I went through a broker to help me link me to the supplier of that asset, and I paid a legal fee or a commission or a bonus, then that's a direct transaction cost. Or I had to transport that asset from wherever I bought it from, if it's a car from Japan, and it has taken me three months, uh, but it has eventually come. So the transportation cost, or even those, uh, uh, those uh, custom taxes, those customs, those taxes, which are unavoidable, all those are part of the initial cost of that asset. Others, I would not have spent them if it weren't for this asset. So they are non-avoidable. They are not, you can't avoid them to get this asset ready for the intended use or ready for the intended, yeah, intended purpose or intended use. But we shall also say plus any capitalized borrowing costs. So if there are any borrowings you've made to be able to buy this asset and you've borrowed money uh, and you've incurred a cost called a borrowing cost under a standard called IAS 23, then that borrowing cost shall be capitalized as part of the initial measure of this asset, as long as this asset is a qualifying asset under IS-23, implying that it has it takes it has taken you substantially a long period to get the asset ready for its intended use, and in the process you're already incurring an interest on the monies you actually borrowed. So in that case, we shall also say, plus that capitalized borrowing cost up to the point when the asset is ready for the intended use. But where applicable, assuming that you have a present obligation either to dismantle or to decommission or to restore or to actually take away that asset, then that decommissioning cost or dismantling cost, which is under I-33, uh, sorry, 37, shall also be included. So the decommissioning, at times you can call it dismantling cost, or at times people can call them the removal costs, the removal 
course under IAS 37. So if there is a present obligation, whether legal or constructive, that demands that when you've used that asset and completed using the asset, you must dismantle or remove it at your own cost, then that cost of dismantling, I must also include it as long as I discount it to present value using an appropriate discount rate, is part of the initial cost of the asset. So if I have that initial cost of the asset and uh, subsequently I'm having that asset with me and I have to continuously repair or service or maintain that asset. IAS 16 says that that subsequent, that subsequent expenditure to maintain or to repair or to service the asset shall not be capitalized, but shall be recognized in the P&L periodically as a periodic cost in the period in which you have incurred the repair or the service or the maintenance cost. Otherwise, if subsequently I am replacing a major component of that asset, like assuming that I'm talking about a building and I'm replacing all the doors and chairs, sorry, all the doors and windows. In that case, that replacement cost is a capital asset, sorry, a capital expenditure, which shall be capitalized. Or I'm replacing the roof. In that case, and as long as these are major components you're replacing of the building, then that shall be capitalized. And what IAS 16 says is that you should even have separated those assets in the disclosure notes, not on the presentation. In the presentation, they are part of PPE as one item, but in the disclosure, in what people call the assets registers or details, you should have separated them because they have separate useful lives and therefore their depreciation rates are going to be different because their replacement or recycle life is actually kind of different. So you should actually be having them separated and have them depreciated over their own life so that when you replace them, you are replacing them by first of all, taking out the old asset from the balance sheet, therefore derecognizing the roof and then replacing it with a new cost, which you are capitalizing in form of a replacement cost. Now, if there's even any major inspection cost, assuming that this asset is an asset that requires major inspection periodically, maybe every after five years, then that cost you are incurring as a major inspection cost should also be capitalized as part of the asset at the time that you are incurring the inspection cost. If you do an, an inspection, a major inspection every five years, then that major inspection is going to be a separate component within the asset whose useful life is five years and you separately depreciate it over five years that when you come to another inspection, you'll actually first uh, take out the any balance of the last major inspection cost you capitalized, which you've not yet amortized through a depreciation and then clear it out by decognizing it from the asset and then put in this new major inspection cost that you've actually incurred. Otherwise, at the end of the year, each year, this asset needs to be remeasured, either using the cost model or the revolution model. So over the life of the asset, there are certain expenditures on that asset that either need to be capitalized or need to be expensed. If there are mere repairs or service or maintenance, those additional expenses need to be expensed in the PL. But if there are replacement of major components or major inspection costs or overhaul costs, then those shall be capitalized. But every year at the reporting date in the balance sheet, we shall always carry a new cost or a cost for this asset or a measure for this asset based on either cost model or revolution model. IS 16 predominantly encourages the use of the cost model, not by stating it in the standard, but by putting a lot of conditions on the revolution model, which are very hard to comply to. For example, if you wish to adopt the uh, revolution model, there will start with one that is easier, that uh, that all assets in the same class must be revalued. But again, the subjective thing there, it means that if you have cars as your assets, and some cars are in the city, Chigali, and others are up country, you don't only revalue the cars in, in Chigali city, all the cars, but they will not only be cars, but all your motor vehicles. So all the motor vehicles fall in that category or in that class, except if you stratify your classes separately to say that I have the long motor vehicles and I have the small motor vehicles. I'm only revaluing, revaluing the small cars or vehicles because that's a class on its own. It's different from the long vehicles. Otherwise, to the extent that you have a category or class, we shall have entire class revalued. Now, that is a little bit easier, but has a lot of subjectivity. 
to ensure that strictly you've attended to all items or assets in the same class than being selective and only select those assets in the capital city where the values have gone up. You have done it all summary all the assets in the same class. Otherwise, you must do it regularly. Again, there's a lot of subjectivity there to say, what is regular for my company? It could be every year, it could be every after five years, it could be every after 10 years. Again, there's a lot of subjectivity there, but that subjectivity should ensure consistency that you're doing it every when there's a new reason. It's not necessarily every five years. That's not what we call consistency. Consistency is on the basis that the reason why I have revalued is because there's a new value for my cars, which has emerged because of changes in technology. So everyone there's a change in technology, then I will revalue. So that's the revaluing, which is uh, supposed to be sufficiently regular. Thirdly, which is the hard one, is that that value must be based on an active market price. And that active market price is driven by the principles of I-513 to say that, is it the principal market? If the answer is yes, good. Otherwise, that market should actually ensure that you are valuing it in the, in the basis of the highest and best use. Uh, in the absence of that principal market, you go for the most advantageous market. Now, all those conditions must be satisfied for you to have applied the revaluation model. In the absence of any of those conditions, you shall stick to the cost model, which is more practically easy to deal with, but also it's more reliable because there's that conflict between faithful representation and relevance because you're trying to give up-to-date figures. You're giving that relevant information, but you may be so subjective to the extent that you can manipulate your figures. And in that case, it's not even faithfully represented. So there's that clash or conflict which you examine an AFR can ask you to debate and discuss and come to a conclusion. Now, I'll tell you that there are those non cut assets, including even PPE, where the board can say, and before that maybe, I'll tell you that as a rule of thumb, all PPE must be depreciated to impact on that measure. Whether you are using cost model or revolution model, you you must depreciate. If you're using a, you've used a revolution model, the depreciation shall be based on the revalued amount. If you're using the historical cost, then the depreciation shall be based on the historical cost on the basis that you're using the straight line method. Otherwise, if you're using the reducing balance, then the depreciation shall be based on the opening value each year at that rate that you are applying as a reducing balance rate. Please note that everyone you're using straight line and you're talking or explaining the approach of using straight line method of depreciation, which is implied if the question is silent, does not tell you which method to use, always know that the straight line method of depreciation shall be as a result of, or shall be affected by the useful life of the asset. So you keep dividing by the number of years and also affected by the residue value of the asset, which residue of value of the asset is an estimate. So you shall say historical cost is 10 million, minus residue value of 1 million. So the difference of 9 million is what I'm depreciating over 10 years. So please, that is a requirement for straight line method. Useful life and the residue value, which is not a requirement for reducing balance. Reducing balance, you don't say that I'm dividing over years, or you don't say minus the residue value. You get the opening balance times the depreciation rate, and that becomes the depreciation based on the reduced balance approach. Please help to explain to the directors if the question is help to uh, explain to the directors with calculations how the depreciation charge shall be computed now otherwise uh if that asset is impaired which i'll talk about i36 because of indications so in impairment is not every day and i want you at afr level you should be able to separate and distinguish between depreciation and impairment Depreciation is every day or every year, and it's normal and it's expected because it's arising from wear and tear. Every when you use an asset, just take an example of your car. When that car was new, it was actually good everything. But as you continue to use it, then it becomes getting it starts getting issues. So in that case, it's depreciating over the year. So that's normal. It's very normal and should be done every year. But impairment loss is incidental. It just falls you. It's not that it's planned. You plan to depreciate because you're using the car and therefore you shall depreciate it every year, but you don't plan to have impairment until something comes to indicate that something is, uh, there's a problem. So for example, if the car gets into an accident, it's not a plan that, you know, I've planned the car to get an accident. So if the car 
gets an accident that is improper, that is incidental, and that actually is an indicator that the car may not be functioning as it was before the accident. So I must conduct an impairment loss, and the basis of impairment loss is to determine the recoverable amount, which is the high of value news and the fair value less cost of disposal. But I it's incidental. So the, in the exam, when the question is in there and you're discussing these issues, you are actually clearly telling the examiner or the person reading your script that the appreciation is normal and it's required and will happen every year, except an asset in form of a free load, freehold land, which is the one that you'll not depreciate, but otherwise all other assets you'll depreciate, all other PPE items you'll depreciate. But freehold land, no. Leasehold land, depreciate. In other words, leasehold land will go under IFRS 16 leases to have it amortized or depreciated over the lease period. But freehold land, do your own, that one you don't depreciate it. So in that case, I'll tell you that it's very possible, practically possible, that the board can sit and approve a recommendation from management that some assets are not of use anymore. We don't need them, but we have to have them disposed of. The disposal can be coming from three ways. Either I can say that I'm not using these assets anymore. I don't need them. I'll abandon them. I'll just people call it ground them. I'll ground them. I'll just put them somewhere and keep them there. I don't need them. So in that case, the board has approved that. Secondly, the assets which you say I don't need them anymore. I'll give them away as a gift. I'll donate them maybe to the best working staff. I'll give those cars, the old cars, to the best employees or employees who are retiring. So those are actually going to be donated assets. Thirdly, I can say, I don't need these assets, I'll sell them. Those are the ones that will fall under the category called non current assets held for sale under IFRS 5. So please, the ones that we decided to abandon or the ones we decided to donate are going to remain under IAS 16 until we de-recognize them. Otherwise, the ones that we are selling off are going to be shifted or moved from IAS 16 PPE to IFRS 5 to classify them as either an individual asset held for sale, or if it's a group of assets, we shall call them a disposal group of assets held for sale. In that case, when we have a disposal group of assets held for sale, we shall only classify that asset, that category, or that asset as a disposal group of assets held for sale if two conditions are in place. One is that that asset or disposal group of assets is available or for immediate sale in its present condition. So if today is Sunday, 13th November, and you have sat in a hotel or a restaurant as management and listed out assets that you think you don't need and waiting for the board meeting tomorrow, where the board meeting will be the one to approve in that case, those assets today Sunday are not yet available for immediate sale because the board meeting has not yet approved. So today they are still PPE. Or even on Monday when the board approves and says, yes, it's okay, let them be sold, but let them first come or let them first go to the uh, up country and first deliver the goods. And then when they come back on Tuesday, then that is when we shall have them ready for sale. So on Monday, even when the board has approved, they're not yet available for sale because they're still going to do some office work to take goods to the, to the market or to take goods to the up country. So then still IS-16, they're not yet available for sale. They're not yet IFRS-5. So they must be available for immediate sale. Secondly, and second condition is that sale transaction must be highly probable. That word highly probable is going to be supported by certain issues. For example, management must be committed to the plan to sell. The sale transaction must be taking place in a short term or short time that should not exceed 12 months from the date of classification, except where reasons why you have extended are beyond your control, like COVID lockdown. People would not continue to sell because the government has locked the country and therefore people were not able to come and view those cars to buy them. So in that case, yes, that condition is still on because as long as you're still having it ready for sale, there are people, there are companies which say it's ready for sale, but 
uh, if we still have any issue that requires that car to take goods to the market, we can take it from the parking yard where it is and we'll take the goods to the market. So that car is not yet available for immediate sale. In any case, even the sale transaction is not highly probable. And thirdly, we should also say that the sale shall be at a price that is reasonable to the nature, to the status, and to the type of that asset, a reasonable price. And in any case, it should be very hard for management or the board to ever reverse that decision to change without any significant consequences that come with that. So that's where we shall manifest and support the fact that the sale transaction is highly probable. If that asset is classified as held for sale, if and it was PPE, now that it's classified as held for sale, we shall say that today that it's moving from PPE to classifying it as held for sale, we shall do a farewell party for it while it's in PPE. Let me use that as an example. So we shall do a farewell party to say bye-bye from PPE, and that bye-bye comes with what we call a revaluation exercise to say on the last day it is PPE, we shall revalue it under PPE using the revaluation model of PPE and account for any revaluation gain or loss as PPE as farewell party. Then as at that moment, we shall have it restated or revised to that new fair value to say, now have a welcome party under IFRS 5. So IFRS 5 will say, I've organized a welcome party, but as you open the gate or the door to come into my room for this welcome party, I need to remeasure you with that figure you've just come with, which was revalued from PPE room, but we shall compare it with the fair value less cost of sale to say we want the lower of those two to say in our welcome party as you open and enter into this room, come with that knowledge that we shall come with that figure you've come with, but compared to the fair value less cost of disposal, and we shall take the lower figure to be our welcome statement to you. While you're in this room, we're only having you in this room temporarily for a period of not exceeding 12 months. But if that period is part of the period where the reporting date falls, we shall again remeasure you at the end of the reporting date, even while you're still here with us, at again a new fair value less cost of disposal and take the lower figure again. Now, those lower figures are implied to be impairment losses, which are not going to even I-36 impairment of loss assets, but it's actually getting to uh, be addressed within I-5 to say that even when that asset is taken to be at the lower figure, which is fair value less cost to sell, that reduction or reducing it to the lower figure shall be taken to the P&L as a loss or as an expense. So please never depreciate that asset classified as held for sale. You used to depreciate it as a PPE, as a requirement, but now that it's under IFRS 5, non cut assets held for sale, no more depreciation. Now, I'll tell you that there are some assets that are intangibles, but yet they are very necessary for the running of the company. Recently, I was very surprised when I told, when I was teaching my class, and uh, this student was telling me that it's a surprise to him to hear that a license is an asset. A license is an asset. Why? In principle, an asset is that asset, is that item of present economic resource through which you expect future economic benefits to flow to you arising from a past event. So because I have a license, I can operate my business for five years, if it's a five-year license, which allows me to sell and have economic benefits through sales revenue coming to my company. So a license is an asset. If I can even determine its price or value or measure reliably, then in that case, which is the cost of the license, then in that case, I should even recognize it in my financial statements as an asset, but classifying it as an intangible asset. So intangible assets, therefore, are those assets that don't have a physical substance. You can't see them, you can't touch them, you can't move them from one room to another room, but they are very core and very important to support your business and they are actually resourceful to you. Examples are licenses, a copyright, a royalty, a brand, as long as that brand is not internally generated, you've acquired it by buying it. So all those are intangible assets. Now, under I-38, I've already given that highlight before the break. For you to even say that that intangible should get anywhere in my balance sheet, and I should call it an asset, three things must be in place, and they all must be satisfied beyond and in addition to the recognition criteria. So one is that that intangible asset should be identifiable. Are you able to ever separate it and set it on its own? Secondly, can you be able to legally enforce control over it? Thirdly, can you be able to expect future economic benefits associated with that intangible? to flow to you as an entity. If that's the case, then correct, you have an intangible asset to place in your balance sheet. The moment you have that, then we shall say that how did that intangible come to you? 
The way you got it is the way or will up impact on two things. It will impact on you recognizing it as an intangible and measuring it. Did you get it by separately buying it? If you went to the market and separately bought that intangible asset, then yes, that is the easiest. But I'll tell you, very few cases do we have intangible assets that you can separately go to the market and purchase. Of course, they are there. You can go to the government or to the department or ministry and buy a license. So yes, that license, I can separately buy it. But not all. You can't say that, you know, I'm here and I'm buying a brand. I'm here, I'm buying a, uh, I'm buying a patent. This is the shop where they sell patents. This is the shop where they sell brands. So it's not very, very normal, regular to find marketplaces or market uh, shops which sell intangible assets. Now, if that asset was separately acquired, that's the easiest, but there are very few intangible assets that you can separately acquire. Otherwise, there are intangible assets that you can receive or acquire by buying another company that has it. So mean that you have acquired this intangible asset by acquiring a company that has it. So if I buy a company which already has a license in Rwanda to operate, then indirectly I have acquired that license. And that's an acquisition of an intangible asset by way of a business combination. In that case, i 3 and i 10, those standards deal with group accounts, which is what I'll be looking at next time we meet. I'll tell you that those standards will guide you on determining the price or the initial measure of that license by saying that on the date you acquire that subsidiary, which is what we call the date of acquisition, we shall determine the fair value of that identifiable intangible asset called a license, which was in the subsidiary on the date you acquired. And therefore, the initial measure of that license shall be that fair value on the date of acquisition of the subsidiary. So you could have acquired that intangible by buying another company that has an intangible asset, which is acquisition by way of a business combination. Or again, how did that intangible come to you? Is it possible that somebody gave it to you free of charge, donated, granted, which is IS-20 government grants? If that is the case, then we shall say that any intangible asset, like if the company, if the country, if Rwanda says that uh, uh, there are radio stations and TV stations, so many of them in Chigali, but there are villages which also need radio stations and TV stations, which are remote, and these companies are not going there, yet they also need to get news. They also need information on developments. They also need information on teaching or training. Maybe those districts is where people do agricultural work, plantations and what have you, but they need training on which seeds are better to, to, to plant, and that can be done through radio stations and TVs, through training in there. Then the government can actually grant a license to operate a TV or radio station in those villages by giving a radio operator or a TV station operator. In that case, that TV operator will say, I have a license in my balance sheet to operate a, a, a radio station in the village, but this license, I did not pay for it. I did not buy it from the government. It was granted to me. In that case, the debit of that license will be under I-38, which you call intangible asset. The credit of that license will not be cash because you didn't pay for it. The credit is government grant. If you're using deferred income method, it will go under the liabilities as deferred income. Now, that debit, I-38, and that credit, IS-20 government grants, we need a figure to say by what amount. IAS 38 and IS 20 will combine to say, what would be the price you would have paid the government to buy that license to operate your radio station from the village? That is the normal market price on that debt is the figure we shall use. So how did the intangible go come to you? It was given to you through a grant. There are cases where intangible assets could be acquired through a bat exchange. So what I would do is that instead of actually going to look for that intangible asset on a market, I go to somebody who has the intangible asset and we swap, we share. I give him some asset and gives me that intangible asset. And those things can happen, especially in terms of copyrights. Those musicians that have copyrights, somebody gives them a very good, a good, a good car and this person gives away the copyright of his music. So those are butter trades. People call that butter trade. So the question then is, how did that intangible asset come to me? It, come, it came th to me through a butter trade. If that intangible asset came to me through a butter trade, then in that case, I didn't pay cash, but I gave out something else. I gave out a car. Then the value of the car on the data I gave out is looks like the value would be replacing 
cash I would have given away on the day. If I had given cash, it would be 20 million. Now that he has told me to give a car, I'll get the value of the car. The way I got the value of the cash, which was 20 million. If the value of the car is 30 million, I'll say that therefore the intangible asset I've received through a better trade on its initial recognition shall be measured based on the fair value of the asset I've given away, which is a car whose value is 30 million. Except if I cannot determine the fair value of the car I've given away, that's when I determine the fair value of the copyright I'm receiving or that intangible asset I'm receiving to say if I had bought it, how much would be the cash? Otherwise, it's very possible some intangible assets come to the company by way of internally generating them. So this person or this company has received an intangible asset, not because it has gone out externally to receive it by purchasing it or to receive it by acquiring a subsidiary that has it or to receive it through a bat exchange or to receive it through a donation like a grant, but internally they have developed it. If you have developed your own internal or your own intangible asset and it comes in form of goodwill, like I have done good business, let's assume that Bruce, who's now talking to you, has actually done very good in actually making a presentation and his, uh, his institute called Innes Academy has got a very good reputation. People want to walk in there because they want to hear that summary of IFRSs and they want to listen to Bruce in order to prepare with confidence for an exam. And then Innes comes in there to say, you see, we have a very good brand in terms of the lecturer who's teaching you AFR. So in that case, Bruce has been trained. Bruce has been spent money on to capacity build him to get the confidence of giving you these summaries. So the amount of money that Innes has spent on me internally developing that brand or internally developing that intangible asset or internally developing that reputation is what we shall call internally generated goodwill. I-38 says prohibited and you shall never capitalize internally generated goodwill or any cost related to that good reputation you're developing because you cannot control it. If three things are the ones that make you to recognize an intangible asset, one was identifiability, another is control, a third is uh, future economic benefits flowing to you. One is that I cannot identify that. So even if Bruce has done all that good thing, I cannot separate and say that Innest wants to sell out that I category called Bruce's, uh, at times we call it intellectual property. Bruce's intellectual property, that brain that can talk about summaries of IFRSs and Ines continues to exist without that. It will, it will still need that kind of capacity or skill. So because of that, you can't identify. Secondly, you cannot even control. Why? Bruce can decide to go to another academy or Bruce can start his own or Bruce can actually teach students from his home. And those very students can come to him. So because of that, you cannot legally impose it, except if the regulation in that country demands that that person can only teach under Innes Academy. So in that case, again, I can't control. So I-38 says never capitalize internally generated goodwill because you can't control it and it's not even identifiable. Even if future economic benefits will flow to you, all the three conditions needed to be satisfied and two of them cannot be satisfied. Otherwise, if you have any other internally generated item that results into intangibles, that one, yes, we can, as long as we are very clear about it. If, for example, you're developing a project or you're developing a particular, uh, a particular specimen and you're using your intellectual skill, but first you research, then any research costs or costs on the research stage, those you cannot capitalize them because that's so early a stage to feel and co be confident that there will be future economic benefits. You're still getting views of people who are going to buy your product. So in that case, all research expenses you've incurred, these people are going out on the streets with questionnaires or going out on the street to kind of give the awareness. The expenses you're meeting on them like bonuses or allowances or transport, those are research expenses which shall be expensed in the p &L. But the moment you've got an information from the market that yes, we want that product and you start developing it, if you're not yet sure of what you're producing, developing, because you need to first go and test it in the market, then that period up to testing and the prototype testing is still developing when you're not sure. So we shall still expense that testing or whatever you're developing to be tested because you're not sure. But the moment the market has given you another feedback to say, yes, that one is a good. And even the government has given you a license to continue to develop that product. And you have tested that the product will work and be successful. Then that subsequent or continued development cost shall be capitalized. And in I-38, they'll give you six, condition, six conditions 
under which you can say I'm capitalizing development cost, but only from the point the six conditions are satisfied, not going back. So you don't retrospectively go back to say, even when I really started developing before I even tested it. So it's only from the point when all those conditions are satisfied. So your exam expects you to be aware of these techniques and principles because non cash assets must be examined in your paper. It can come in form of tangible assets or intangible assets like you're hearing me talk about here. But please remember whether it's intangible assets or tangible assets, it's even very possible that you could have borrowed the money. But maybe before that, I'll also tell you that this intangible assets as similar to PPE, a, the moment you have ascertained that how did I get them to determine that, because again, three things on intangible assets like PPE, you need to recognize with the other three conditions, identifiability, control, and a feature flow of economic benefits, you need to measure. Measure is how did you get it? And that measure is broken into two, initial measure and subsequent measure. Initial measure is how did you get the intangible assets? Did you internally generate it? Or did you get it from outside? How did you get it from outside? Did you separately purchase? Was it donated? Was it butter exchange? Was it granted? So those, those kind of things. But then secondly, how do we subsequently measure? Before we look at subsequently measure at the end of each year, each time you have an intangible asset that is in your balance sheet, as a requirement, you shall amortize it. Amortizing is similar to depreciate. So this amortization <coughs> under I-38 is usually using straight line method, not reducing balance. Straight line method, not reducing balance, implying that you must always determine these two factors. One, the residue value. Secondly, the useful life. Residue value for intangible assets is usually zero, except if you can support that it has a residue value of more than zero. Other is useful life of an intangible asset is always structured into either a finite useful life or indefinite useful life. Because if it's finite, and please, finite is not indefinite. If finite implies that it has an end, maybe 30 years or 20 years, so it's a 10 year license. So it has a 10 year license uh, uh, period, so it's finite. So I'll amortize over the 10 years. Otherwise, if it's indefinite, it means that it has no expiry. It will be there forever. Then in that case, I-38 says that one, don't ever amortize it, but assess two things every year. Assess whether it continues to be indefinite and also assess impairment loss every year. That is for indefinite. Please, please, please. It's only three categories of intangible assets that you shall never amortize. One of them I've mentioned it. Intangible assets with indefinite useful life, never amortize them, instead assess them for impairment loss. The second category of intangible assets that you never amortize are those intangible assets that are not yet put into commercial use. So there are cases where I can come to Rwanda and get a license to operate, but I don't start the business now because I'm still looking for capital. So that license, if it's a five-year license and the first two years I've not yet started the business, I should not amortize, but assess for impairment loss. So any intangible asset that is not yet put into commercial use, I shall never assess, I shall never amortize it, but I will assess it for impairment loss. The third category of intangible asset that you shall never amortize is purchased goodwill. That one never amortize it, but assess it for annual impairment loss. You see, AFR is very nice. These things, you can sing them like a song. I can go to the exam. The moment I know those principles, my examiner is always going to give me a question which is original, expecting me to know these things. And therefore, in the scenario, I'll say that this is purchased goodwill, not internally generated goodwill, and therefore it's an asset. Because I have purchased goodwill by me acquiring a subsidiary, and therefore I have an intangible asset, I shall never amortize it, but assess it for impairment loss. Or I get in the scenario and find that there's an intangible asset with indefinite useful life, I shall never amortize it, but assess it for impairment loss. Or I find in the exam that there's this intangible asset, which is not yet put into actual commercial use, I shall never amortize it, but assess it for impairment loss. Now, implied in that is that at the end of each reporting date, I must carry this intangible asset with a value. That value is going to be remeasured either using the cost model or the revolution model like in IS-16. However, the cost model is more easier and practical. 
and usually would be the case for intangible assets, while the revolution model can be practically impossible. Even if it's possible to have a revolution model for PPE, for intangible assets may be practically impossible because of that third requirement when I gave you the revolution model one, remember all assets in the same class must be revalued. This can happen maybe also intangible assets, all the license or all the items or all the brands, I can have them at there. At, at their, uh, 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 measured to fair value. Second condition, I can actually have them revalued regularly. So that one is also okay. But the third condition is to have that revaluation based on an active market price. I'll tell you that indeed and practically, intangible assets, most intangible assets don't have an active marketplace. That this is where I go to a shop to buy patents or to buy brands or to buy copyrights because of the lack of that active market price or place and price, then it's practically impossible to revalue intangible assets. And that's why it will be very fun of you in, 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 in the exam, starting to advise the company, they therefore use a revolution model to revalue the intangible assets. And when the revolution results into a revolution gain, we shall take it to the other compressive income and finally to the revolution result, you are actually hitting no point because in the scenario, the examiner will have mentioned to you that there's no active market or it should be implied by the nature of the asset. If it is maybe a license that have markets, I can go to the, this district or the other district, or I can go to this particular regulator or, you know, so in that case, yes, that's okay. But if the examiner says it's a copyright or it's a patent or it's a brand that you are trying to revalue, please, I will tell you that that is practically impossible. The other thing, remember that any internally generated brand can never even be capitalized as intangible assets. So just start to think about the MTNs, the Airtels, or those uh, companies with those strong trademarks or brands. Think of how did they acquire that brand. If they internally developed it, then that expense of developing and even maintaining it should be taken to the PNL. But if they went and bought, if Airtel went and bought a brand called Tigo, then yes, Airtel will be correct to capitalize that brand called Tigo and even amortize it in the financial statements. I'm giving you the examples. This paper is practical. You need to actually live with the practice that companies are supposed to be doing because you're the technicians and the technocrats of those standards in your company after this paper. Now, I was coming back to tell you that if I have intangible assets or tangible assets, and because of the huge investment cost, I had to borrow money from the bank and that money from any loan provider had to come with an interest cost. And it took me substantial a long period to get this asset ready for intended use. Then such an asset shall qualify to be a qualifying asset under IS-23. And the borrowing costs have been incurred up to the point the asset is ready for intended use shall actually be capitalized as part of the initial measure of the asset. And IS-23 says that that borrowing cost shall start at the earliest of the day you commence actively getting that asset bought or that asset constructed. And that borrowing cost shall continue to be capitalized until and therefore cease when the asset or when the activities relating to that asset getting ready for intended use get or cease or come to their completion. So if I'm getting this car from Japan and it's taking me three months to get it to Chigali City, then we shall say that on the day it gets to Chigali and I've received it. Or let me take the example of a, a, a construction of a building. If I'm constructing a building and it takes me six months to complete the construction, it means that on the day the building is ready for use, I should stop capitalizing that borrowing cost. Any subsequent borrowing cost or interest I'm incurring on the loan I borrowed, maybe I borrowed a loan for three years, then any subsequent borrowing cost after six months when the building is ready shall be expressed in the PL. Even in between the six months, if there was any temporary suspension of the construction, because maybe the government said we are in a lockdown for two months and we cannot co go to construct, or because I needed the value, sorry, the surveyor or the engineer said the house or the building needs to first dry before we go to floor at all. And we had one month or two months where we're not constructing actively. Then that one month or two months, so it could even be a strike by the workers. Two months they were striking, so they are not constructing. That expense interest cost in those two months shall be expensed in the PNL because they don't relate to active construction of the building. So your examiner 
combines IAS 23 boron costs with any non current asset that you borrowed that money for. If that borrowing was even specifically for that construction or purchase, then we shall go with the specific interest rate. If this, and please here at AFR, I want you to be very clear with this. Your examiner can be very tricky to say, you borrowed, the company borrowed 100 million francs at an interest rate of 10% or fixed interest rate of 10%. Then the examiner says that that 100 million dollars, so 100 million francs shall be refunded or paid back to the bank in five years time with a premium in total paying 110 million francs. But every year, you're also paying interest of 10%. So mean that your total cost on the borrowing is not only the 10% 10, 10 you're paying interest, but also that extra 10 million when you go back to the fund, the money is also part of the in cost you're incurring. So that examiner will tell you that the effective rate of interest due to the premium is 12%. Please don't capitalize the borrowing cost with 10%, but 12%. In other words, every when you have an effective rate of interest that is linked to a standard called IFRS 9 financial instruments, then your borrowing cost shall be capitalized based on the effective rate of interest, not the fixed rate of interest. Secondly, every when you borrow from so many sources or so many different borrowings to make a pool of borrowing, then the interest rate you're going to use shall not be one of the rates. It shall be a weighted average rate of interest, which is going to be determined using a pro rata approach. In the exam, be aware of that. Where applicable computers that, uh, that borrowing rate, either weighted average borrowing rate or effective rate of interest, not necessarily the fixed rate, if you have those others. Okay, so your examiner can combine a question or a scenario that has borrowing cost with an asset, especially PPE, and also government grant, when that grant is related to an asset, and is aware that you are aware that any grant related to an asset shall be capitalized with the asset, but then that capitalized grant shall be accounted for under S20, either using the deferred income approach or shall come directly to reduce the cost of the asset based on what people call or technically call the reduced basis method in IS20. Whichever way, we shall have that government grant taken to the PL on a matching concept to match it with the expenses to which it relates to. In this case, if it's related to an asset, it will go to the PL in the same time period on a straight line basis, the, in the same time period like the impact of that PPE on the asset on the PL, which is the depreciation rate. So if the depreciation rate is 10%, maybe the asset is 10 years, also the uh, release or the transfer or the amortization of the government grant shall be based on 10% from the deferred income account in the liabilities to the PNL. So examiner can actually combine all that. Now, there's an impairment of assets, which is covered under 36, but uh, let me see if I have another relevant question to what I've just finished from the chat from you. Somebody is asking, what's dismantling cost? That word dismantling in English means to remove. So if I have a building that I've constructed on the street in Ichigali, and the government says that after you've used it for the 10 years you've come here in Rwanda to use that building, you should, you should destroy it, or you should, uh, how do I, you should break it. So the word breaking, at times people call it uh, dismantling. Or at times people call it decommissioning. So that's what that word means. Your examiner will make it simple. It will tell you that the uh, company is required to destroy the building. So that's that word is to mean dismantling. Another student is saying that you may show this by generalizing the transaction. It can help us like how to capitalize the cost of inspection of a non-current asset. So the student is saying, help me write the debit and credit. So if I have incurred a major inspection cost of 20 million francs, I'll credit cash and bank. Because 20 million has gone out of my bank. The debit is debit the PPE with that major inspection uh, cost. So the debit entry goes to the PPE. I'm hoping that student has been helped. So the moment I say capitalize, I'm implying debit on the PPE. If it's capitalized it in the liability, I'm saying credit in the liabilities. But here we are talking about assets. Okay, so we have the non-current assets. 
sorry, we have the uh, impairment of assets. Uh, we've talked more about this, so I'll not talk, take a lot of it. So please impairment should be triggered by an event. It's not normal or common that every year there should be impairment. So either there's an accident or there's a market interest rate that has gone up or there's a change in technology or there's a change in law and regulation, something should trigger or something should spark off an impairment loss review. And impairment technically is to conduct an assessment of the recoverable amount of that asset or cash generating unit, which is the, uh, the high of the value news and the, uh, and the fair value, less cost to sell. And at this moment, you know what value news means, uh, but you also know what a uh, uh, fair value less cost of sale. But in the value news, it's important that you always use an appropriate discount rate, which is, should be pre-tax discount rate, not post-tax. We're not computing weighted average cost of capital in your FM papers, where you're also taking into consideration tax issues. Here, we're looking at pre tax discount rate and cash flows here should be relevant cash flows, relevant cash flows for that particular item, including the fact that it should be future oriented, not sunk, not past, not historical cash flows, and they should not exceed or go beyond five years to be more rational, rational in those uh, cash flows to ensure that you have them in this. And those cash flows should be run around the fact that they should be the best estimate to get those uh, cash flows. And then you discount them using that appropriate discount rate, which should have risks that are specific to that asset and should be a pre-tax discount rate. The moment that recoverable amount uh, is lower than the carrying amount, then yes, that asset is impaired and you are required to write down that asset to the recoverable amount by recognizing any payment loss, either for that asset or if it's a group of assets for a cash generating unit, how do you recognize that impairment loss? Take it always to the PL, except if that same asset had a revaluation done recently or some time back, and that revaluation had a gain, and that gain is still in the revaluation reserve, then that impairment loss initially take it to the revaluation reserve and have and wash out that revaluation gain. And the excess impairment loss is what you take to the PL. Otherwise, if it's a cash generating unit, remember that that impairment loss, the by the way, it's an individual asset, it's easier to deal with the debit. So to deal with the credit, you'll deal with the credit by reducing the asset, credit the asset by an impairment loss and debit. The debit is what you need to think about. Is it debited to the PL or to the revaluation reserve or other compressive income, depending on where, uh, whether this asset previously was revalued. Otherwise, if it's a cash generating unit, it's not easy to deal with the credit. The debit is easy, you'll debit the PL with that impairment loss on the entire cash generating unit, but the credits are the ones that you need to actually separate or split. That separation of the credits is why we come to allocate the impairment loss in the cash generating unit to say the first credit shall always go to the goodwill where you have allocated and therefore taken that goodwill up to zero by allocating it with the impairment loss. An excess impairment loss, you allocate to the other assets on a prorata basis, as long as you are aware of the limit that never reduce each individual asset to a figure that is less than the highest of three figures, either zero figure or a, 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 a net, a fair value less cost of sale figure for that asset if you can determine it, or a value in use of that asset if that figure can be determined. Other is the credits are the business of the cash generating unit, which assets are you reducing and by how much? Okay, please, you can never reverse back impairment loss to goodwill. Your AFRA paper can bring in cases of subsequent reversals of impairment loss, but what drives a subsequent reversal of an impairment loss is the fact that the very issue or factor that brought about the impairment loss last year should be the one that is reversing. If last year the reason for impairment loss was because the market interest rates by the central bank were high and now the central bank has reduced them, then that is the very reason that has made you to reverse subsequently your impairment loss, but never reverse back to goodwill. You can reverse back to the other assets, as long as even to the other assets, you don't increase them to a carrying amount that is above the carrying amount that would have happened had that impairment loss not happened, which we call the normative carrying amount. Okay. So I'm trying to move on quickly to see whether we can get to a, uh, a standard where I'll have a question. So let me also summarize. I know financial instruments are very important. I'm wondering whether I should summarize them. Uh, so some, let me summarize them. I know you've had your tuition provider summarize, sorry, give you the details. Please, financial instruments are basically going to only be organized, sorry, recognized if there's something that's contractual. 
Again, does not have to be written. And this standard or IFRS 9 and I32 and IFRS 7 will actually say that the financial instruments will be accounted for by both parties in the contract. One party always has a financial asset. Another party either has a financial liability or equity instrument. Both of them shall apply this standard or these standards on, I, on financial instruments. So one party that has a financial asset is always called the buyer, the purchaser, or the acquirer. While the party that has either financial liability or equity instrument is always called the issuer. He has issued debt instruments. He has issued shares. So he, if he has issued shares, then he has equity instruments, so he's the one recognizing equity. Or he has issued debt instruments, so he's the one saying, I have a financial liability in form of a loan. But the purchaser, the one who bought that loan not, or the one who bought those shares, is always the investor who shall recognize this as a financial asset in form of an investment. Please, in the exam, look out for those words that this one purchased or bought or acquired. So he's a purchaser, always he has a financial asset. While the other one, if the question says he issued, then that issuer either has a financial liability or has an equity instrument. In the event that is very clear that it's a financial liability, or it's very clear it's a financial, uh, sorry, equity instrument, then it's clearly that issuer is going to credit share capital if it's equity instrument or uh, financial liability if it's clear straightforwardly that it issued uh, debt instruments. Otherwise, there are cases where it's not very clear. Legally, it looks like it actually issued equity instruments, but in substance, they're not equity instruments. So in that case, we shall use the substance of a form approach to say, please recognize them as this. For example, issued preference shares, and those are equity instruments. So legally issued equity instruments, but these are redeemable. Mean that after five years, he needs to fund back the money to the person who bought those uh, preference shares. Then in substance, it looks like he borrowed money, which is to be redeemed and refunded back in five years time. So in substance, that's not equity instrument, but that's a financial liability. So that issuer shall not credit equity, but shall credit financial liability. Even the dividends he pays over the five years shall not be presented as dividends in the statement of changes in equity, but they shall be presented as finance costs because in substance, this was a loan and therefore it's interest or finance cost in the p &L. Otherwise, it's very possible that this uh, issuer would have issued an instrument that is compound. For example, convertible loan notes. So on the face of it legally, those are loan notes. So he has borrowed somebody's money. But the person who has lent him money has a right to convert that money into shares to say, yes, I've given you 20 million francs, but in two years, in five years time, I can actually have you give that, that money to me in form of shares, not in cash. So in that case, this issuer has a complex status resolve to say that therefore, it looks like in substance, he has issued two things. One, he has actually issued a loan note and secondly, he has also issued equity instruments to this person who has given him the 20 million. So that issuer shall account for both by starting with the liability element or the financial liability element, which he actually determines by discounting to present value, those future expected cash he will be paying the interest, fixed rate of interest and the refund, but discounting them using the effective rate or market interest rate to get the present value, which becomes the financial liability element. And that financial liability element subsequently, he needs to keep measuring it through amortizing it under IFRS 9 as a financial asset carried at amortized cost. But the balance or the difference between the total money he has received and the one he has allocated to the financial liability is what technically we shall call the equity element. That is what he will take to the equity account, not calling it shares, he called it other equity reserves, but that one he shall never remeasure it. It's static, it's fixed right from day one. It can only be reclassified to share capital at that point in time, in maybe the, for the at the end of the uh, maturity period, when this person says, me, I want now shares. Otherwise, it will continue to be in the reserve, in the equity reserve, never change its figure, it remains in there. So that's very good for you to remember. Otherwise, this person who has bought or purchased or acquired, calling it a financial asset, IFRS 9 says that that person, right for them, for him, right from the day one, he must initially measure. So two things, or three things again. One is that we need to look at recognition. So this person needs to deal with recognition of this financial asset. Secondly, needs to measure this financial asset. And thirdly, needs to disclose in the notes to the financial statements details about this financial asset. The disclosure is under IFRS 7. 
However, the recognition which it starts with says that uh, for him to recognize this as a financial asset or a fi yeah, financial asset or instrument, he needs to be a party to the contractual provisions of that financial instrument. So it needs to be part of the contract, either written or implied. But secondly, he can only recognize it in the financial statements on the basis that it's an asset based on the definition of an asset and the recognition of an asset in the conceptual framework. When he does that, then he needs to deal with the measurement. Initially on day one, when this person is saying, I am recognizing this financial asset with a debit, and then he needs to pick a figure. That figure for the financial asset will be based on what category or class of financial asset is. So that's when he starts asking himself, what category or class of financial asset this is. If it's an asset carried at amortized cost or an asset classified as fair value through other compressive income, then that day one, he will initially measure it at the price he has paid to get that financial asset plus any transaction cost may be engaged a lawyer. So you will debit the legal fees as part of the initial measure of the asset. You will not debit the legal fees as an expense in the p &L. You will capitalize that legal fee because he must di directly capitalize the transaction cost. Otherwise, if this is a financial asset he has classified at fair value through p l profit or loss, in that case, he shall take that expense called the legal fee in the p l as an expense, not capitalize it. In that case, therefore, he has classified on the basis that he needs to initially measure this financial asset and subsequently at each year end, he will shall continue with those classes. Some of those classes are permanent. He can never change them. For example, there will be a permanent class called fair value through other compressive income. He can never change them, change that class. Other classes, he can change them. He can change and shift subsequently from the class called amortized cost to fair value through profit or loss. But he cannot change the other way around. He cannot come from fair value through profit or loss to amortized cost. So ideally, please, as you go to the exam, for financial assets, clearly know that what determines the class for him to have that initial measure, what determines the class is two factors. One is the business model. What is his business idea or plan for holding this instrument? If the business model is to contractually recover the cash flows, then the second is how is he going to contractually recover the cash flows? First of all, the business model is to contractually recover the cash flows up to the maturity date. Or he's contractually recovering cash flows, but he can even sell during the period of the maturity. So if it's to contract recover the cash flows up to the maturity date, and the second condition is what characteristic will be those contractual cash flows, if the characteristic is that they will have interest and principal, then indeed this is a financial asset carried at amortized cost. In any case, that is a debt instrument. He has lent you money, which he shall recover with interest in it. Otherwise, if he can even sell it, even if he has lent you money, 50 million, but it's for five years, but if he gets somebody who can actually take over that loan, like a factoring company, and he can sell it to him to actually get his money back earlier, then in that case, it's not a financial asset carried at amortized cost, but a financial asset carried at fair value through other compressive income. So financial assets carried at fair value through other compressive income can include debt instruments. In FRA, they never do that, but at AFRA, you need to know it. But they can also include equity instruments, which people at F FRA know only. So if I go and invest in shares, because I have 100 million on my account, and I don't have any use for it, and yet I don't want to keep it in cash on the bank account, it's not giving me a lot of investment return, I can go and buy shares from a high performing company. In that case, I have invested in equity instruments. If I don't plan to resell those shares, to make a gain, but to hold my reserve in form of shares, that profit I wanted to keep on the, on the bank account in form of shares, then implied in that statement is that I have made an irrevocable election or a permanent election to classify and to hold and classify this financial asset at fair value through other compressive income, which has come in form of equity instrument. So in FR, that's what students know there. For you at AFR, you should also know that it can also include debt instruments, which the company is not in the business model only holding until maturity debt, but can also have them sold in the process. So that will also be carried at fair value, but through other compressive income. Others, all other financial assets that don't fall in amortized cost or fair value through other compressive income by default are at fair value through PL, including those that are held in a short term speculatively to make a gain. 
those are going to be classified at fair value through profit or loss. And indeed, for such assets carried at fair value, even whether, whether they are through OCI or through P&L, we shall have them fair value every year and fair value changes appropriately recognized either through P&L, if they are carried at fair value through P&L or through other compressive income, if they are carried at fair value through other compressive income. Please note at AFR, your examiner is very tactical here. If these are financial assets carried at fair value through other compressive income and you sell them because you, there are debt instruments which you are holding to sell. If you sell them, that cumulative gain or loss that you were putting in other compressive income, you are allowed to classify it to p and L. I I want to repeat that statement. If these are debt instruments where you expect to receive or recover contractual cash flows, either by waiting, sorry, in this case, you're even ready to sell them. So in that case, they are debt instruments, but you classify them at fair value through other compressive income. When you sell them, then the cumulative gains and losses you put in other compressive income, you're allowed to reclassify that to the PL. But if these are equity instruments where you have made a permanent decision or, perman or, or uh, permanent election to hold them at fair value through other compressive income, even when you sell them, those ones, you shall never reclassify the cumulative gains or losses to PL because IFRS 9 prohibits them to be taken to PL. At AFR, that is examinable. So you need to see in the scenario, is the examiner giving me a debt instrument where the contractual cash flows can be, uh, sorry, where the business model is to recover contractual cash flows, but these debt instruments can be sold anytime. In this case, their financial assets carried at fair value through other compressive income because they don't pass the test to be carried at amortized cost. If the examiner says that, therefore, this year the company has sold them, and in the period before, the cumulative gains were 200 million, then in that case, you are advising to say that those cumulative gains should be reclassified to the PL on the sale. But if the question is equity instruments, which were actually elected permanently to be classified at fair value through OCI, you shall never reclassify the cumulative gains or losses to P and L. Please, at AFR, those financial assets can be assessed for impairment loss, which is in accordance with IFRS 9, not I-36. Please, that impairment loss may not be understood by students who are doing FR, but you at advanced financial reporting, you are expected to know. It is only financial assets carried at amortized cost or fine debt instruments that are carried at fair value through other compressive income that we shall conduct an assessment for impairment loss if the indications, not if there are indications, if you even foresee indications in future that this person you lent money may not be able to pay you through what we call credit reference bureaus, reports from credit reference bureaus. So the banks in Chigali, on the basis of IFRS 9, using the information they get from the credit reference bureaus, are able to check whether they've taken a risk to give Bruce a loan or they have given uh, uh, David a loan, which is not risky. If they've given Bruce a loan on the basis that the credit reference bureau says that Bruce at times where when he borrowed in the past, he took long to pay money. Then in that case, the bank shall use the expected credit risk approach we expect to run a risk, to use that expected credit risk approach to therefore on initial recognition through stage one, to recognize an impairment loss on that debt it has given Bruce. Even if the debt is classified at fair value through other compressive income, if the bank says, and you know nowadays the banks are very willing that if they've lent you 200 million, if another bank says, and the loan was five years, if another bank comes to say, no, we want to buy that loan from you and continue with this Bruce, for the remaining three years because we are giving him another loan. Then the banks are willing to sell that loan. So I, ideally that loan shall be carried at fair value through other compressive income by that bank as a financial asset. So in that case, that bank shall still assess for impairment loss using that stage one based on the credit rating they've gotten from the credit Re reference bureau for Bruce to actually say, I'm assessing impairment loss, but based on a lifetime expectation of only 12 months from the first day I give him the loan to see if there's a risk that in the first one year, Bruce may default on paying on time. 
based on the report from the Credit Reference Bureau. And the examiner will give you that information, giving you the lifetime expected loss in the first 12 months and the percentage. They will give you a default percentage to say the rate or the possibility is 10% uh, based on the lifetime expected credit loss in the first 12 months of maybe 10 million of that figure. And that will be the impairment loss to recognize. Please, that impairment loss, don't go and immediately say, I'm crediting the asset. Yes, you can debit the P and L, but don't credit the asset, that financial asset immediately. First, take it to a loss allowance account. It's at the end of the year that you'll shift it from the loss allowance account by crediting it out of, sorry, debiting it out of there and crediting it off that asset. I'm hoping you're able to hear me. me I, these things are part of me and I know those all those things. But with experience, based on the two weeks you're left with, you should also be able to jangle around this because your examiner scenarios are in there. More likely, they can be in there with financial assets that are going to be assessed for impairment loss. And you still think that's only assets carried at amortized cost. No, even assets carried at fair value through OCI, as long as they are debt instruments, not equity instruments, debt instruments those who shall assess for impairment loss and using expected credit loss based on stage one initial recognition, but also stage two. If after I have given a loan to Bruce, I realize that there are significant, there's evidence, it's not evidence, there's, an, there's fear that Bruce is starting to struggle with cash or the industry in which Bruce is operating from is starting to struggle in the market in Rwanda and he may not make the sales to actually pay me money on time or pay me all that money, then IFRS 9 requires you to actually conduct a stage two impairment loss review. And that stage two impairment loss review must be done at the reporting date if those indications are there. Otherwise, stage three will also be done only when there's actual evidence, like for example, if Bruce is declared bankrupt in Rwanda, or Bruce is actually declared to be having liquidity problems, when that actual evidence is there, then IFRS 9 says you must do a stage three impairment loss review. Both stage two and stage three shall be based on the lifetime expected losses, which we shall take all of them, not, not a percentage. So we don't take 12 months, we don't take a percentage, we take the entire lifetime expected loss. Okay, financial liabilities, easy. That's the easiest. Under IFRS 9, financial liabilities are either carried at fair value through P&L, but most financial liabilities are carried at fair at amortized cost, and we shall need to amortize them using that effective rate of interest. Please, the word amortizing here does not mean reducing the asset, like depreciating the asset. Amortizing is to remeasure that financial liability or to measure the financial asset. And that measurement comes through using the effective rate of interest compared to with the actual interest rate. The difference, that figure difference is what you use to measure that financial asset carried at amortized cost or financial liability carried at amortized cost in a way you are amortizing it. It can be increasing its value. In most cases, you're increasing its value. Now, as a rule of thumb, which I will tell you that even for IFRS 16 financial, sorry, leases, if when you have a financial liability, this financial liability is going to be increased or it's going to be remeasured by looking at two things. One, you're increasing it by the finance cost, but you're reducing it with the repayment you're making. It will also be for the lease liability because by nature, lease liabilities and IFRS 16 are also financial instruments, though they have their separate standard IFRS 16. But by requirement, if when you are actually recognizing the measure of that financial liability or lease liability, you shall remeasure it by increasing it with the finance cost and reducing it by the repayment of the lease rental. Now, in your paper, it's also practically possible that beyond those financial assets or financial liabilities that are held or uh, classified at fair value through profit or loss, which are not very many, they are rare, especially for financial liabilities. You could be having hedging instruments, a derivative instrument, for example. So that derivative instrument is involving two people and it keeps swinging to one person is in a favorable position. And that's why we shall call it a financial asset based on the fact that the conditions are potentially favorable to me. To the other part, it's not favorable. And therefore that forward contract, which is a derivative instrument, 
is actually being a financial asset to me, where it's favorable, and therefore I call it a derivative asset. What to the other person, if the exchange rate is not in his favor, he's calling it actually a liability, and therefore it's a derivative liability. To the extent that I have classified that derivative instrument as a highly effective hedging instrument, and I wish or choose to use hedge accounting, which is examinable at your level, then I am going to apply hedge accounting, having classified whether this is a cash flow hedge or a fair value hedge. Because if it's a fair value hedge, and I need that symmetric approach to say that this hedge is able to offset either fully or uh, in a big way, the loss I had feared or the loss I was going to suffer. To the extent that it's able to do that, and I'm able to use the hedge accounting, I'll actually go in to say that any fair value hedge and the hedging instrument in a fair value hedge, its changes in fair value shall be taken to the PL immediately to offset the loss I've suffered in the PL and have it reduced because it's an effective hedging instrument. So the fair value change on that hedging instrument is taken to the PL at the same time, like the fair value of the hedged item, that hedged item is that transaction. Uh, or that asset or that item or liability that you have edged against, whose fair value changes you've edged against. Otherwise, if it's a cash flow hedge because you forecast to pay money to a supplier from Dubai in three years, three months time, at a foreign in a foreign currency where the exchange rate may not be in your favor, translate your francs into the dollars. Then in that case, you've gone to arrange a forward contract with a bank. In that case, if that is a, a, a derivative, sorry, a cash flow hedge because it's going to impact or bring about cash inflows in there. Then IFRS 9 says that initially the fair value changes on that cash flow hedge, which is the hedging instrument, is initially or tentatively first held as a reserve and other, other compressive income. Then it waits until that good or those goods you're getting from Dubai come to Rwanda and you start selling them and they go to the PL through cost of sales. Then you release this fair value change, which you had put in the OCI based on the fact that you saved the money in the uh, translation from to the dollar, and now you release it to the PL to match that cost of sale, those goods which came with a high value because of the exchange rate that went up. You go and now offset it by releasing this figure from the other compressive income now in the PL. So that's for the cash flow hedge. Initially, OCI and waiting to have it released to the PL, but only in the time period in which the hedge item impacts on the PL. Times I had thought that I would summarize financial instruments in just two minutes, but uh, anyway, we've been able to go through it <laughs> uh, in a way that I think maybe you should be comfortable, except if you have questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, I'm looking at the chat. The chat has uh, what about treatment of an overhaul under I-16 or that one was I-16. Overhaul is like inspection. It's like a, a replacement of a major component. So overhaul is, I can overhaul the engine of a car. It's like I'm replacing with another engine. So I-16 says capitalize that cost of overhaul. So it's debited on the PPE. So the student who's asking that. Eh? Somebody says, come again briefly on how we account for assets held for sale on when an asset is considered as held for sale. We said that for you to consider an asset held for sale on the day you classify it as held for sale, two conditions. It must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. Don't have these stories that you know, I need to first take it for repair. You know, it has to first go to the, uh, to the district to take the goods there. So it must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. Secondly, the sale transaction must be highly probable, but then you give it a fair well party by taking it from the other uh, standard by through revaluing it and changes in the fair value revaluation are dealt with in that standard as part of the fair work, then it enters in this new standard, but based on the lower of that new value you have given it and the fair value less cost to sell. And in this case, you are starting to write it down right from the entry and continuously, you keep checking it based on the fair value less cost to sell. Where everyone goes down, you have to account for the figure going down through a loss or expense in the p &L, but never depreciate it. So I think that student I'm able to, answer that student. So that takes me back. Then another one is saying, come again on the interest rate to be used on borrowing when we are capitalizing those interests. So there are three kinds of rates to use. One, you can use the fixed interest rate if that's the only information you have, that I have borrowed 20 million to buy a car and that car is to be used in my business and it's going to take long to get the car ready or in Chigali. 
So if you borrow at 10% as the interest rate, then that's the interest rate to use. It's a fixed specific interest rate. Secondly, you can have borrowed that 20 million to buy a car, but from different sources. Maybe you have five different bank loans and each loan has a different interest rate. In that case, the interest rate is not the weighted average interest rate. So that's the second rate you can use. And thirdly, the interest rate you can use is the effective rate of interest. Even if you borrowed at a specific rate of 10%, but you'll have to pay back that loan, not, not only paying interest rate of 10% every year, but also paying that loan with a premium. Uh, 20 will be maybe 25. And that premium has given you an effective interest rate of 12%. Our uh, interest rate shall be the effective rate of interest. So please, the interest rate will depend on the circumstances under which you're borrowing. If you're borrowing one-off and it's not going to change, it's the same, even effectively, it's that fixed specific interest rate. If you're borrowing from so many and therefore you have a pool of borrowings, then it's going to be the weighted average interest rate. If you're borrowing, but yet there's a different effective rate of interest because there's a premium in the loan you're borrowing, then we shall go with the effective interest rate. So I'm hoping that uh, I've been able to uh, address that person's uh, question. Then another one is saying, dear lecturer, uh, this is Jean Pierre. Dear lecturer, how will we access this recording after this session for further rehearsal? That is Iqbal, not me. Iqbal is receiving or has your emails and then they will actually send you this recording because uh, the session is being recorded. Eh? So never worry, just uh, follow up with Iqbal, but I know they do. Okay, then another question is, what does it mean by impairment on goodwill uh, cannot be reversed? So it's a requirement first from the standard that never reverse impairment loss on goodwill, but also practically you can see the reason why. So goodwill is reputation. So if my reputation is damaged, it's very hard to restore it. So if the reputation of a company has been damaged, me, I know of a country, I will not mention for political reasons, I will not mention that country. I know of a country where a very, very high profile person was actually killed one time because that person was actually dealing or was putting or putting a lot of pressure on environmental rights, which were being damaged by one of the companies in that country. So what that country, what that company did, what that government of that country did because that government was lying heavy on this company for resources, for so much political support. What they did was they actually had to go through a political kind of struggle with this person and they had this person go through a court and the court ruling was to have this person hanged and killed. So then they can actually go away or draw with the pressures that this person was raising on environmental protection and collapsing this company. So after that, the products of that company have not sold up to now as well as they used to sell in that country up to now. So the damage of that company in terms of its goodwill is permanent kind of. So IFRS I-36 says never reverse a permanent loss on goodwill because at times when that damage of your reputation is made, it's very hard to bring it back. So that country, I'm talking about over 20 years from the time I remember that story. Up to now, the information when I go to the website and actually do a Google, on the sales of the products of that company, the sales, the profits have continuously gone down in that company. So their goodwill completely got damaged from the day they actually killed that gentleman. The come from the day the government killed that gentleman. So that's the reason that we can never reverse goodwill, impairment loss back to goodwill. And there's also the standards prohibits it. Everyone, I say that word prohibit, it's a rule that never reverse even before you get the reasons why. I've given you this story to give you the experience why even the ISB thinks you can never reverse. Somebody is saying, what about amortized cost? I don't know what you want to know about amortized cost. I've told you that amortized cost is basically done both in IFRS 9, but it also goes to IFRS 16 leases. When you have IFRS 9 and you have a financial ability carried at amortized cost, it means that every year end, you're going to have it measured on the basis of the opening value plus the finance cost minus the uh, minus the refund or the repayment. And that also applies to IFRS 16 lease liabilities. Every reporting debt lease liability is based on the opening lease liability balance plus the finance cost minus the, uh, minus the amount of the lease liability you've repaid. So you're amortizing it, especially that finance cost is actually going to be based on the difference between the effective rate interest cost minus the fixed interest rate 
that you've cash paid, which is already new accounting entries. So you are amortizing. So amortizing here is not to depreciate, to put it down, but amortizing is to measure, it can even go up. Another student is saying, how about hedging uh, on I-32 financial instruments? Hedging is not I-32, it's IFRS 9. Though both I-32 and IFRS 9 are on financial instruments. So I've talked about hedging to tell you that hedging is a choice. Hedging is not a requirement. You choose to use hedge accounting. But that choice is based on the fact that there are conditions you must satisfy. One is that the hedging should be based on a hedge item, which is a derivative, sorry, the hedging instrument should be a hedge, a derivative instrument. A derivative instrument, I32 is the one that first defines it, fine, but IFRS 9 continues to define it the same way. To say a derivative instrument is defined by its characteristics, its value is based on something underlying, and its value keeps changing over the time. But secondly, you have no money to, sorry, thirdly, you don't have to invest by buying a huge, sorry, spending a huge investment cost, or if there's any upfront cost, it will be very minimal. So that's, that's what we call a derivative instrument, which becomes the hedging instrument. Otherwise, under IFRS 9, you can only choose to use hedging accounting if you have, in the first place, a derivative instrument as your hedging instrument. But secondly, the hedging should be highly effective or assessed to be highly effective for you to even apply the hedge accounting. And there are two types of hedge accounting, either it's a fair value hedge or it's a cash flow hedge. And I've talked about how to account for each of those two in terms of the accounting for the changes, the fair value of that hedging instrument, which is the derivative instrument. Okay. Then somebody is asking, come again on when do we make irrevocable election? You don't have to sit in a board meeting and say, I have made an irrevocable election and it's a board minute. No, it is by implication, by how you are treating that item. So irrevocable election is only for equity instruments, not debt instruments. But then, if the reason why you want, you have bought this equity instruments, maybe a company can buy shares of another company because you are not trading in them. So you're not buying those shares to sell them speculatively to make a profit, but you are keeping your reserve in shares rather than keeping your reserve in cash. Then in that case, that's, that practice is implied to make an irrevocable election that you'll always keep your reserve in shares. And therefore it's like a permanent election to have kept it in shares and therefore you're classifying this asset at fair value through other compressive income. So in reality, it's by the nature of how you're managing your arrangement or your instruction or your business plan or business model. Otherwise, in the exam, the examiner will mention that word that the company has made an irrecover, irrevocable election or a permanent election. The examiner will make it for you. Don't, he's good enough to make it for you, don't mind. That word will be there. For you to know that, therefore, these are going to be classified at fair value through other compressive income. Somebody is, again is asking me to come back on derivative and hedging. I think I'm trying to summarize this topic. Derivatives by nature are financial instruments carried at fair value through P&L. Because it's not a requirement to apply hedge accounting, it's a choice to say, for me, I will not classify them at fair value through P&L. I'll have them uh, uh, accounted for as hedging instruments under hedge accounting. If those conditions in hedge accounting apply, if you've satisfied them, for example, it's a hedging instrument. Secondly, you have you can confirm that it's effective in hedging against or offsetting the loss that you're trying to hedge against. That loss could be a fair value loss, which is a fair value hedge, or it could be a cash flow, forecast cash flow loss, which is a cash flow hedge, or it could be in respect of a net investment in a foreign operation, which is when I will come back to talk about foreign operations under IS21, if IS21 is where you have foreign operations, if those foreign operations, they have uh, transactions in a foreign currency, which is exposing you to a foreign currency risk, then you can hedge against that change in the fair value of the foreign operation, which is your net investment in a foreign operation. That is so similar to a cash flow hedge. In that case, based on the type, you'll account for that hedging instrument based on the type of hedge. If it's a fair value hedge, then the fair value changes in that hedging instrument are immediately taken to the PL to match them with the fair value changes on the item you've hedged against, and that will offset. Otherwise, if it's a cash flow hedge, initially we shall take the fair value changes on the hedging instrument in the other compressive income, waiting for that moment in time in future when the hedged item impacts on the, on the PL, and that's when you will release this uh, fair value on the hedging instrument to the PL to offset or to match that uh, fair value change on the hedged item that is in the PL. So I think I've mentioned that. I've repeated it again. Somebody is saying which 
updated books can we use? Because you find that current, currently examiners are likely to test more theories and cases which are not in their syllabus. I will tell you that the examiner in ICPAL is examining you based on the syllabus and based on the content. That content is what I told you that don't rely on one source. You may even today, this video is another source. This could be some information that you're hearing for the first time, which is helping you add on the little information you already have. So the more enlarged or the more increased your sources are, the better prepared student you will be on the exam date. Please, in addition to sources like the equal materials you have, or even you have the lecturer notes, you have this recording, you have websites like of professional courses like SCA, which have these materials free of charge as well, not in the details, but at least uh, technical articles in there, you can use them as well. And they will not ask for any specific student details that should, you should be a student of SCA. You'll get them right from the homepage. So those are some of them that you can actually be able to get all this kind of information. Please never get worried that your examiner is examining you out of context. He's examining you within the syllabus and I'm covering information based on the syllabus of your ICPAL exam. Okay. Then somebody saying, sir, this is Fiona saying, sir, come again on the treatment of accounting for the hedge. Again, oh dear. Fiona, I think when they are running out of time, the recording has it. If you can access the recording, I've mentioned it now three times. I can't mention it the fourth time. It's the same information. Eh? So let's just move on. You please ask for the recording, but I know Iqbal will give you the recording even before you ask, more likely at the start of this coming week. Eh? Uh, so fine. So I'm worried that we're running out of time and yet I've not gotten to uh, do a practical question. I'm thinking of what to do at this moment. I see I have leases. I have employee benefits. That's why I wanted to do a practice question on employee benefits. So these are the two options. And I know one of them may not work. One of them would be to extend uh, beyond our time because we're only left with one minute to close. And then I'm able to get to the practical questions, which I know is hard because uh, more likely the other programs Iqbal has after my session uh some of which involve you students doing the same papers on another revision otherwise the second option is to actually next meeting i'm going to only deal with questions so next meeting i'll not actually come down to say i'm talking about because what's taking me longer now is to talk more about financial instruments because questions are coming in talk again talk again or talk more which is what your lecturer should have done. Today's uh, program was to summarize and put you in the exam mode, not to do the lecture, which you are attending in another, in a school or by a tuition provider. But anyway, so if you feel that second option is good, then what I'll do is I'll close it here, knowing that next time we meet, we are going for questions, a question on IS-19 employee benefits, because that is very important. It's in the exam you always but usually students don't do well on that or a question that has leases especially leases by the let it's in the exam students may not be doing it very well or a question on group accounts which is what i want to do that next time i meet especially group accounts that have cash flows because at times students may find it easier to deal with a group accounts question on a profit or loss and other compressive income or a group accounts question on a balance sheet but can find it a little bit tricky to deal with a group accounts which is a cash flow so i want to think that next time we meet which is uh the way Ferguson said we are actually dealing with those questions some of the questions are these key standards which i want i had planned to do today so today I had planned to do a question on IS-19. I had planned to do a question on deferred tax, IS-12. I had planned to do a question on uh, share-based payments, IFRS-2. I had planned to do a smaller question uh, under maybe IFRS-16 leases. Uh, also a question maybe on uh, related party disclosures, because that can be tricky, or operating segments, IFRS-8. Then I would look at those computational questions that have group accounts next meeting, but let me also deal with these uh, narrative questions, maybe next time, if you think that's okay. So if that's the case, I want to bring this to a close. 
if Felicity is in there, uh, just for us to know that the next time we're meeting, we're only purely doing questions and I'm picking them from the past two exams. But we can get Felicity and his, uh, uh, if he's in there, we can get his advice anyway. If he thinks we can take an extra time to deal with questions from past papers. Felician, are you in there? Okay, I'm not hearing him, uh, but I'm not very sure whether I'm allowed to go beyond the time <laughs> because uh, I need to be very cautious. Eh? Otherwise, I see somebody has raised us and hand up. Maybe that one is okay. I'm allowed to do that. LEC, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well. Eh? Please, uh, you can talk and you can unmute. Eh? You have a question, LEC? Yes, it's all. Okay, fine, you go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, fine, you have no question, eh? Okay. Somebody called Aphrodite, Aphrodite, sorry. You're so free, you can actually talk. Your, your, your hand is up. Thank you, sir. Mm. My question is about it. Hedging accounting, it seems like this topic is so complicated. Mm. So, if possible, I want you in the next session, you may come up with practical questions so mm. that we can get more understanding. Okay, so hedge accounting. So, we we get a practical question, and uh, we can have both a cash flow hedge and a fair value hedge so to get a good grip on it. Fine, I've put it aside so. I'll have that question next time we meet. Okay. Then I see Pari Pasu. Uh, if you have, I see your hand is up. If you have a question, you can raise it. Hey, hello, sir. Mm. My question is still about the, the problem of uh, time constraint. You see, we have uh, a session of four hours and we still have uh, a lot to cover. I don't know how we we'll go on about this. Okay, so that question is administratively answered by Iqbal. For me, I'm being instructed. So they are the ones to instruct me that Bruce come in and cover four hours. Uh, so if uh, you can have it raised with Iqbal, I'm okay. Uh, remember that I've also shared with you our contacts or my contacts. You can still be able to access me even beyond the lectures or beyond what Iqbal has organized. Remember, Iqbal is organizing this as a complement. Eh? So that's assuming that you have a lecture or a tuition provider who's doing the same. But what I'm doing on behalf of Iqbal is to wrap it up. But you can still raise a request for them, maybe for an extra special time. OK. OK, fine. Then. Uh, Somebody else here, I see Shadrach. Shadrach, you also have a hand up? Yes. Hello? Yes, Shadrach, we, we are you. Oh, just uh, because of constant time, you may, in each I phrases or IAC that you want to, to show a uh, practice, you may do a question and then mm. you you may send us and then mm. for us we watch after because mm. the time is rushing okay so that's a good option a suggestion of course yeah. of course i have yes. to send them to you through iqbal so for me i have to give it to iqbal and iqbal passes it over to you through your emails eh? but yes, it's a good no suggestion problem. it's a good suggestion that i'll share with iqbal as well eh? okay you may do okay Fine. Then uh, I see who else has a hand up. Uh, now these people have talked, but uh, I seem I think they still want to talk. Uh, Can you have like thirty minutes of doing some practical questions, sir? Done. 
Can't we have like 30 minutes and do some question on employee benefit? Yes, I would. My problem is that I may not have the permission until Iqbal gives it to me because they told me to go up to midday. And it's already six minutes past midday. Uh, I'm only extending because of the questions. Otherwise, I was hoping if, uh, if uh, Felician is in to give that allowance. I know usually the reason is that they have a tight program. They may be using this Zoom account for another paper. And they are waiting for me to hold it. And somebody, another lecturer is actually hanging around waiting for me to use this. Mm -hmm. Or they could be even be having another paper which some of you are supposed to attend. So that's why it's a little bit tight. But if Felician is in there, he can help us answer that or address that. Excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. As you see, nowadays they are in examination paper, they are likely to test about the public sector, mm. about the IPSAS and IPFM mm. framework. So mm. if possible, you as an experienced person, you, you may advise us about mm. what So what I'm going to do next next time we meet, I'm not going to go in the details of the if IPSAS, but I'm going to summarize because all these IFRS I'm talking about are exactly what IPSAS has, but IPSAS will just change a few things to say that under IPSAS 17, uh, which is PPE, we actually are going by also an extra element beyond what you talked in IAS 16 PPE. So I'll just bring in those extras, but I also try to uh, put you in the mindset of the examiner that when it comes to IPSAS and if uh, I if miss those are that uh, that system that the government uses to prepare uh, its public sector financial statements. Uh, we shall look at exactly what is it that usually goes in there, including the aspect of budgeting, our appropriation of funds. So all that uh, we shall just summarize, not to go into the nitty gritty details, because the examiner knows that uh, you can even do the IPSA, IPSAS as long as you know the IFRS and just revise it towards the context of the uh, public sector entity. So I'll do that. It will be a summary, not details. It's a summary of not more than even 20 minutes. Okay. So I think that brings me to a close of uh, our session today. And uh, I've not had, uh, oh, Felix has a question also. Felix, you can ask. I'm taking the advantage of you are raising hands. Otherwise, I know Iqbal knows I should have closed. Felix, you can ask. I saw your hand up. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I would like to, to, to ask you I heard from uh, IS21 foreign exchange, to foreign exchange. If it will be possible you, you, in a, another session, mm. you make a, another clarification about that IS so that you can take mm. more information about it. Okay. So in my next session, one of the practical areas I'm going to look at will be group accounts or consolidation. In consolidation is where you may find a subsidiary which is taken to be a foreign operation, which is therefore first translated or financial statements are translated using IS-21. So while I look at IS-21, then I'll also extend it to the fact that there could be transactions that are individual entered transactions that could be in a foreign currency. And how do we deal with those exchange differences, even the translating and even the exchange differences that emerge. So that session, I need to basically be tactical to ensure that even if the time is a constraint, I need to bring out some of those very key important areas uh, in there, especially if I can look for a question that has a foreign currency transaction. So that takes me to the foreign currency uh, implications of a transaction in an individual enter or individual entered transaction of that nature. Okay, so I think we have come to a close. Please allow me to close this session so that I'm in the good books of Iqbal, especially if they need to use this um, same Zoom account for the next uh, revision sessions they have. Eh? Uh, so, but uh, we know we have another session to catch up and that's where we shall start from there. That session is going to be purely practical. And uh, I'll ask you if you have books 
or you have uh, computers, will work with me as we write the answer because I will be giving you the tip and the approach and how the examiner marks to say that point is the one that earns your mark, either is beyond or without that point, you're not earning a mark. That's my major interest to give you that confidence of how to write the exam. Can I wish you a lovely Sunday and a lovely week to come starting tomorrow? And uh, please, happy to have had time with you today, but also excited to meet you again. Felicia, and if you're in there, your closing remarks, otherwise for me, I've closed. Okay, so I think that brings us to a close. Let's meet again next time we meet based on the timetable. And uh, good afternoon. Eh?